Okay, welcome everybody. Um, tonight we have a full agenda. Um, we are going to start with public comment. Um, then we will move on to the president's report where we have some student recognition. We have an educational presentation for the VHHS and LHS STEAM showcase. Um, it took place at both. Um, the student school board rep reports. Uh, we'll turn it over to Dr. Herman for the superintendent's report. Uh, we do have a consent vote agenda that includes items that were just turn it over to Chairman uh, Batson for the program and personnel committee portion of the meeting. We have uh, several board policies to review as well as some contracts. And then we will um, hear from Chairperson Rooney for the facilities and finance committee. Um, we will have an executive session where we will discuss collective negotiating matters, 5 ILCS 120 slash 2C2, as well as some board self-evaluation, 5 ILCS 120 slash 2C16. At, when we are completed with executive session, we will return to open session. No further action will be taken and we will adjourn. So um, we will start with roll call. Batson. Here. Kara Benjamin. Here. Don Carmichael. Here. Kara Drumkey. Here. Lisa Hessel. Here. Sonal Kulkarni. Here. Stacey Rooney. Here. Great. <clears throat> we note everybody present. We're going to begin with public comment. Um, I'm going to call people in the order that they signed in. Um, I ask that you limit your comments to three minutes. Um, after we hear from the people that are here in person, I'll ask uh, for any emailed public comments. Um, and first up, we invite Becky Clay. Yes, yes, yes. Go right up there and speak into the microphone. Just say your name and then um, feel free to start your three minutes. All right. Good evening. My name is Becky Clay and I have a son that attends. I've been attending the Zoom um, school board meetings since he started school he's a sophomore right now and after watching the last school board meeting that happened i just wanted to come and express my sincere thanks to the staff to the teachers that are the frontline workers day in and day out with the students to all the administrators to all the school board members i just want to say thank you for your support for your hard work I'm a fellow educator and I wanna say, I see you, I hear you and I walk alongside you. And um, that's, that's, that's why I'm here tonight. So thank you for everything that you do. Okay, next up we have Marnie Novaro. Good evening. Uh, my name is Marnie Navarro. I'm a proud District 70 and District 128 graduate, District 70 parent, taxpayer, and litigator. I'm deeply concerned that the comments made by the board at the end of the last meeting reflect a fundamental misunderstanding of the law. The board indicated that it intended to unilaterally generate metrics, which you presumably intend to use to reinitiate um, masks and other mitigation measures when the thresholds of your own metrics are met that shows that you still don't get it. So I'd like to walk you through the law here tonight. Judge Grishow stated that the IDPH found that masks, tests, and vaccines are a form of modified quarantine, and that under the IDPH Act, people have the right to object to these procedures. And if they object, they are afforded due process rights. She further found that the delegation of authority to school districts regarding public health and safety is an abuse of power and was never contemplated by the legislature. What you said at the last meeting that you're going to enact metrics by which you intend to rely upon to reinitiate masking and other mitigation measures without guidance from the IDPH and without affording due process to objectors is illegal. I'm talking to you, sir, please. Thank you. 
Governor Pritzker attempted to circumvent the pending court action, action, including appealing to the fourth district and sought for the JCAR to extend the mask mandate in schools. The bipartisan JCAR committee unanimously ruled, declining to extend the school mask mandate, which expired on February the 13th. The fourth district then issued its ruling, denying the state's appeal as moot because the IDPH emergency rule containing the school masking mandate had expired and was not extended. Pritzker, belligerent to the end, then appealed to the Illinois Supreme Court, who likewise declined to hear the appeal. This means that the litigation is proceeding on its merits before Judge Grishkel, not on a temporary basis, on a permanent basis. Importantly, neither the fourth, the fourth district nor the Illinois Supreme Court ever addressed nor overruled Judge Grishkow's substantive reasoning. They merely declined to rule because the subject masking mandates had expired such that the issue was moot. Given this backdrop, why on earth would District 128 unilaterally initiate metrics? particularly when over 93% of school districts who have gone mask optional and the Illinois state lifted the statewide masking mandate effective today. Judge Grishow and the fourth district did carve out a scenario whether an individual school district had its own policy saying that would have to be addressed on a case by case basis. You're at Do three minutes. One moment. Do not misunderstand and think that this comment confers authority to you that otherwise does not exist. In order for your metrics to be lawful, you would have to present your metrics at a public you're meeting. You're at three minutes and you're finished. Okay, you know, I'm giving you really more expensive legal advice than you're getting. I, I'm, not, I'm not asking you for legal advice, nor do I take public comment to be legal advice. Your okay. three minutes are over. I ask that you respect everybody else's time. I do. And see the I, microphone. I, I do. Come and get me. Stay in your lane, District 128 board. Stop acting like a primary public health enforcement entity. Get back to your actual business of educating our students. Thank you. Next, we have Dale Sherman. Hello, I'm Dale Sherman. I'm a D128 parent, a D70 parent. Thank you for your time tonight. I'm not sure we're gonna get very far by being belligerent to the public speakers, the people who came here to comment. It's, um, you know, they, they, they spend a lot of time thinking about these things. They, they sincerely want to share things with this board. And I would hope that the board would be open to what they have to say. Uh, I was disappointed last week, uh, two weeks ago, I guess it was when we met. Um, I think a misrepresentation was made. I'm not suggesting it was intentional but a vote could have been had two weeks ago. You had mitigations on the agenda, so it was publicly noticed. You had a quorum present. All it would have taken would have been a motion, a second to the motion, and there could have been a vote. It's Robert's rules of order. I think it's consistent with, with the, the bylaws of this body, and there could have been a vote on, on masking, and that, that didn't take place, and the representation was, no, we can't do it. It might not have been customary, but certainly it would have been proper. And it, it's, it's a shame that, that the representation was made that, that it could not have happened, it could have. And I think it's consistent with the whole way that this was handled. It was handled without transparency. It was handled at odds with the law. And even the way that people were treated two weeks ago, it suggested that the board's position, the official position was, we will follow the law, but only if you sue us. It's gonna require you to sue us in order to get us to follow the law. And it's, you know, what sort of moral example does that set for our students and our community? What sort of ethical example does that set for our community and for our students? And what is the legal example there? So if it's not, wasn't clear before for the last two years, it should be abundantly clear now from recent rulings, you don't have authority to create mass mandates. You don't have authority to act independently to create mass mandates. You don't have authority to have the testing mandates, the quarantine mandates. You need to work very closely with IDPH, even their authority is limited. And you have to make room for due process for objectors. That should be abundantly clear. So I ask that you continue to try to follow the law. So far, that hasn't happened. Um, I hope you get better counsel from your high paid counsel that you have. And either, either good advice was given and not followed, or not so good advice was given and was followed. Thank you.
Next is Erin Khan. Good evening, board. My name is Erin Khan. I am a taxpaying resident and a parent of two soon to be Libertyville Wildcats. I spoke at the last meeting along with so many other outraged people who have been fighting to be heard by the school board. What has struck me the most throughout this ridiculous debacle is that this school has chosen such a difficult path forward. This school chose to alienate students. This school chose to ignore a court order. This school chose litigation. This school chose to be held in contempt of court. This school chose to ignore due process rights. This school board chose to ignore their constituents. This school has done nothing but choose division. After all those speakers last time, myself included, this board conducted a meeting that went completely backwards. You spoke about the need for your own school metrics. Suddenly you felt you had the knowledge, capabilities and authority to put your own metrics into place. Suddenly you felt that you were scientists or doctors or authorities on public health. While I understand the conversations were maybe a brainstorming session, I found it ludicrous that any one of you felt that you have the credentials or authority to create public health metrics for future mandates. This of course would be illegal without guidance from the IDPH and giving due process rights to those who oppose. I hope that this school board understands their place in the decision of public health and that you understand that whatever metrics you may put into place, you cannot mandate anyone against their will or give them their due process rights. I hope you understand that your constituents are still paying attention. We will continue to demand to be heard and to demand the very best of this board. While I do appreciate all of your time and hours spent in what is probably a rather thankless job, District 128, please stay in your lane and get back to the business of education. We the people can decide for ourselves what serves us and our families best. Thank you. Was there, and that uh, is the last person that I had on the list uh, for sign in. Was there anybody else wishing to address the board? Okay, do we have any email public comment? Yes, I do have one. This letter is from Jeffrey Brahms. My name is Jeffrey Brahms and I'm a junior. I would like to express my disappointment with the recent board decisions. I, like so many other members of the community, recognize that the pandemic is indeed receding from its peak last month. This did not and does not justify the rapid changes in school policy. I wish that there had been more planning, consideration of the circumstances, and progression down a path of lowered mitigation over several weeks. Instead, the, ab the abrupt decision-making caught students and families off guard. The changes made over the past days have bred severe animosity and tension within the school community. I ask that you pay due attention to the local statistics. Please create a concrete plan and maintain readiness to revert to higher mitigation if needed. I encourage you to exercise prudence and avoid haste in future decisions. I appreciate that free testing is available to all students by request of the administration. This is a step in the right direction. Okay, um, so first uh, up on the president's report, we have student recognition. I would like to invite uh, Demarion Baker to come up to the podium. Tonight I invited Marion here to uh, speak with us. This is the last evening of Black History Month. And last Thursday, we held a summit for members of the Black Student Union from Libertyville and from Vernon Hills to come together and have a summit. And um, to close that summit, um, this young man wrote and read his poem uh, to all of us. And I wanted to share it with all of you this evening. Definitely his student voice talking about the importance of recognizing uh, student uh, history, culture, Thank you. My name is Demarion Baker. And um, I like to say Long Live James. This is a poem that I made for the Black Student Union and for my people. I'm black, but it's more to me. 
Why do we learn so much about you when you learn so much from me? But the world don't think that's true. Sometimes I don't. But why should I believe the white Christopher Columbus found land? And why should I believe everything that my history teachers say when it's a lie? We march, we forgave, some stand down, some stand up, some I lost, some I found. Who are you? Damn. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Demarion, for kicking off our student recognition. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. K and Dr. G for the next part of student recognition. Dr. Gilliam and I are very excited. We have a lot of student recognitions, and it has been an outstanding winter for many of our athletic teams. Um, so we're gonna talk about some of the outstanding um, accomplishments, both for our teams and for individual athletes among those teams. So uh, Dr. G, how about we start with our special Olympics? And um, is Mr. Compton here? Coach Compton is here, all right. Very good, we have some athletes gonna come up and. So the first uh, athlete that I have is uh, Joseph uh, Maller, who took second place in the 100-meter snowshoe at the 2022 State Winter Games. Okay. The next one. Ever since uh, every day I see him in the halls and I just call him the champ because Noah Hewitt was first in the state for snowshoe in the 100 meters and first place in snowshoe in the 50 meters. Noah Hewitt, the champ. I have a state champion uh, from Vernon Hills as well in our Special Olympics. I want to introduce Hannah Creech who is the 2022 State Winter Games first place snowshoe 100 meter race champion. Good job, Hannah. <laughs> Andy Compton has been a long time uh, teacher here at Vernon Hills and we've invited Andy, who's the coach of this program, to just say a few words about these fine athletes. Well, thanks for having us. Um, we're honored to be here. Um, we're the sport here that was outside during this lovely winter um, with these three, but these three were amazing. We got to Galena where this takes place. Um, everybody from around the state comes to compete there, the best of the best. They go through sectionals and stuff to get there. Um, we got there, beautiful 43 degree, 43 degree day. This young man ran a preliminary race that was faster than anybody on the mountain. Um, we got up the next morning to have everybody race and it was 14 degrees and it was below wind chill, you know, it was below zero wind chill. Um, but during that time, if you can imagine, I just want to set this picture for you. All these guys had this stuff on plus coats plus snowshoes, and then they had to run a race. All right. Um, we'll start with Hannah. Hannah won the gold in division one. Um, she came out strong. Um, she actually had a funny story in her prelim. She kind of she was a challenging, it was icy. She got out there, did her best she could, but then came back in the final and totally blew away the competition. She was awesome. Um, Joseph is here at second place. And the only reason he's second place is because of this guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
<laughs> we had actually four guys that were as fast as Joseph on our team. Unfortunately, a couple guys got sick and couldn't compete, so we did not have our uh, relay team there. Um, but that leads me to Noah, who is hands down the fastest guy in Illinois. Um, ran at a 50 meter in 8.75 seconds in snowshoes and the full garb. And then he ran 116.75. Um, he was in the highest division. He blew away, unfortunately blew away Joseph too. <laughs> but, 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 but I mean, he set himself above the rest and really deserved the honor. Um, really great to see that happen for our program. So um, congratulations to all three of you. Amazing feats. <laughs> that's awesome all right well uh dr k and i spent uh many hours last weekend at uh, palatine high school we were able to watch the uh, girls gymnastics state meet and uh district 128 did not disappoint uh we were super successful as a school uh, at Vernon Hills, and uh, Dr. K has one special individual as well. But I'm going to call up right now uh, our coach, Coach Denise Caton, who's going to come up and share a little bit about the excitement that uh, ensued last weekend. Denise, come on up. I know I was going to talk tonight, but um, I just want to first and foremost thank Vernon Hills. Um, D128, all the community support we have had throughout this season has been wonderful. Um, you know, whether it's other moms, dads reaching out and my families in particular, um, most of them, I think all of them are here tonight. I can't do it without you. Um, I cannot do it. We cannot do it without my athletes. They are amazing. Um, we went into the state meet with excitement. It was the first time, you know, as a team that we had made it to the state meet in 21 years. So there were some nerves that came along with it, but, you know, we fought through and got into finals and ended up taking home that second place, um, which was so exciting. And then to get into finals, to have a freshman, the first in school history, win a state title. I mean, we're over the moon, you know, and then a couple other individuals um, that were able to place all state too. So we just were very proud and we're thankful for all the support we had this season. Um, and so um, this season, Eliana Burnett was one of our alternates that came to state with us. Annika Chudy. Josie Daniels. Jessica DeLorme. Sarah Gutowski. Christina Raquel. Ori Takanaka, Livy Tron, and Becca Tron. It's been covering the duty the last two times. Is it okay if I leave right after that? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And in the uh, same sport of gymnastics, I am proud to bring up um, our varsity coach, Miss Tiffany Owens. And we're gonna talk about our state champion uh, gymnast as well, Anna Becker. Hello everyone. Uh, Denise so eloquently really thank the district leadership, families, um, Tom, or principal, <laughs> Doc, Dr. Clentes. And um, I really want to thank John Woods to our athletic director for his um, tremendous support. And uh, wow, 21 years since Vernon Hills made it as a team. I think it's been 22 since we've had a state champion because Lauren Petrick started at Libertyville and then moved on to Vernon Hills when Vernon Hills opened. I cannot speak highly enough about the work ethic and the talent and the attitude of Anna Becker. Who, am I allowed to have her come over? Come on over, Anna. I feel awkward talking to you. Now. She is one of the most tremendous athletes I've ever seen in the gym. She is exciting to watch and to take home the, the gold in vault and fourth on bars and 11th and all around just really is amazing. And um, yeah, I just am so excited to see what next year brings because she's only a junior. So we'll be back, we'll be back next year. So congratulations, Anna, for all of your hard work and it is very well deserved. Yeah, I'm good. All right, we're going to keep it rolling in uh, Libertyville with um, is Coach Fowler you coming up and is Coach Cunningham here? Yeah. Just you? There you are. Just, just Coach Fowler. <laughs> coming on down to talk about our all state diver, <laughs> Ethan Paul. Right there with the issue. First of all, good evening. Um, thanks to the parents. We've been together a long time and this has been a great weekend. Um, not surprising, but it was very nice. Ethan just did a fantastic job. He came through, he was a little nervous and we figured out just have fun and dive. And that's what happened. He made the cuts and here we are. He's also a junior, so fingers crossed we're going to be back next year also. Why is his arm in a sling? I'll bet he went skiing after. <laughs> I was not allowed to ski before. <laughs> yeah just for the record um ethan's injury was a dance injury at turnabout not a diving injury so the wildcats we get after it on the dance floor and uh that's uh, that's some proof of that all right so um our next group is a group we're going to recognize three individuals but i also want to say our boys wrestling team qualified they were one of the uh top eight teams in the state this year they qualified for the state tournament um and they did a great job downstate but today we're recognizing three individual wrestlers who placed uh we have two uh young men who placed third in state in their respective weight classes and we have our first state champion in 31 years and so to talk about these athletes i have the great dale eggert coach eggert come on down All right, so these three gentlemen, uh, first up is Austin Gomez. He's a junior. Kaylin Riley, he is a senior. Josh Knudin, he is also a senior. Uh, this, these are the um, 
foundation of a really good team this year. They went seven and zero in the conference and won a championship. They won the regionals and a real close match with McHenry gave us a chance to go to the dual team sectionals where we're able to get past Huntley and, and as Dr. K said, become one of the top eight teams in the state. Um, as a, as in, in the state tournament with their uh, scoring uh, through their individual efforts with the, these three alone, uh, we wanted to place six in the, in the state. Uh, Austin took third at 170. He is a junior. He's also very talented at football and uh, baseball, could probably go to the next level in each of those sports. Kalen took third at 120. Uh, next year, he is headed to the Citadel to wrestle for those guys. And Josh is a um, uh, senior, 182-pound state champ, going to Michigan next year. As uh, Dr. K had mentioned, we had not had a state champ in 31 years. And he said that it was about time that we had a state champ. And I, I would agree. Um, now, if he would have said it after the fact, that wouldn't have meant much. He said it two weeks before, or maybe a week before, I can't remember. And I'm like, I don't know if he's gonna win or not, but I knew he was very serious about it and uh, went, went out and did the job. So I'd like to thank these guys. I mean, obviously the administration, everything like that for uh, setting us up, but these guys, cause I like coming here and, and, and talking about some good athletes, but if they don't do it, I don't get to speak. So thank you very much. <laughs> You can walk it up. Take your picture. Feel yeah. free going up. I want to uh, remind everybody how unusual this is um, and how special it is to have so many athletes from so from both of our schools competing at the highest level shows you uh, the quality of our programs. I also want to mention our cheer uh, programs from both schools qualified for state our dance teams from both schools qualified for state and we currently have academic teams from both schools and things like science Olympiad and math team competing at the highest levels. So it's great to be a Cougar, great to be a Wildcat and lots of uh, great performances to celebrate. Thank you guys. So before we move on to our student board rep reports, I want to thank all of the parents of the athletes. Of course, it is a thrill to recognize the outstanding achievements of our student athletes. But we know that they wouldn't be where they are without the commitment of their parents. So we wanna take a minute and recognize the parents for their- Thank you. And while we welcome you to stay for the whole meeting, uh, we have a lot of really great things to discuss. If you in fact have homework or tests to get ready for, um, now is uh, not an inopportune time for you to take your leave. So thank you for coming, everybody. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and actually, before we get to our student school board rep uh, reports, uh, we have a very uh, important educational presentation about the um, STEAM showcase. So I would like to invite, is it, who's joining? John. John's already up there. Hey. John. Oh, hi, John. <laughs> hi, John. I'm back. And Adam. Hi. hi. Well, uh, so back in uh, 2009, we hired a, a young Adam Lucan who came in here high energy. He was a swim and dive coach. So actually some of these programs near and dear to your heart. And uh, he's got a, uh, another diver over here who finished in the top 20 uh, as well. So, uh, but Adam uh, quickly jumped in with kids. And one of the meaningful ways he did that is through computer science. Um, and at the time, I think we had maybe, maybe two, maybe, maybe two courses and maybe three sections. Uh, and over time, over the last decade, Adam, Adam has built that to at least four different courses, maybe five. The latest is an iOS app development course. 
uh, probably close to 10 sections of that, two teachers worth at Vernon Hills. And I know uh, he's, he's even commuted over to Libertyville this year to work in some of that same stuff. Uh, but he has been just a, um, a, a, a charger when it comes to getting students to do meaningful things uh, in science, technology, engineering, math, uh, art areas, uh, but specifically computer science. Uh, let me just name a few. These are a few I came up with. He's got the Verizon App Challenge, the Congressional App Challenge, the Innovation Fair with the Entrepreneur Class, Hawthorne Elementary South Computer Science Club, Amazon Career Talk Program, Girls' Night of Code, VH Hacks Virtual Event, uh, and most recently, the STEAM Showcase, uh, which is what we've invited Adam and this crew of uh, individuals up to talk a little bit uh, tonight, and they've got a little presentation for, presentation for us tonight to follow as well. So welcome, guys. We're glad to have you here. Adam, take it. So thank you guys so much. Um, we have some amazing, talented students. And what this was, was a combination of community and students. And so we're just gonna honor both of you and say thank you so much. And we're gonna shamelessly plug for next year. <laughs> so let's, uh, we had our event in this area. We had a lot more people, it was super exciting. Um, so the E is actually a three, that's a unique, we included Engineering, which is normal, but entrepreneurship <laughs> and equity on top of the normal STEAM. So, uh, we had a lot of amazing uh, people. Um, Robo, I think Danny Park was one of my students. Uh, he has a franchise of 60 some different robotic thinking um, areas where they teach kids how to program. And we're trying to get some of these guys to go out and uh, teach there. Uh, we had a lot of awesome sponsors. We're just kind of flying through these. I reached out, someone here uh, works at Screencastify and they were graciously uh, donated a ton of money. Uh, Waterway is always awesome uh, donating things. Security Lockway was um, a community member that they donated for us. Uh, all of these, um, businesses, um, we had Abbott, uh, CDW, the Chocolate Chips Association is an awesome program who is meant to help girls get into STEAM, uh, Uline, which is nearby, Tegria is based out in Seattle. Um, we had 117 different projects this year, and this is our first year ever, and so we're very excited that we had 117 come out, and you'll see uh, it was nice, evenly divided between Vern Hills and Libertyville. And um, you can obviously predict that there is a lot more upperclassmen. The freshman slice is very small, but uh, most of these students are working on projects um, in more of these upper class uh, classrooms. Here's the breakdown in our scheme. Uh, the technology one was the great, the most. Um, one that students participated in. Engineering was the least, so we're trying to increase that. Um, but we had a nice uh, mix of it. Uh, Shana Weinstein was my cohort in this. Um, and she is awesome. And she is right now at the um, tryouts. So actually, she has a video. If you would click on her, she speaks better than I. She's awesome. <laughs> Hi, my name is Shana Weinstein and I am a senior here at Vernon Hills High School. I am the president of the Computer Science Club as well as the Girls Who Code division of our Computer Science Club. Next year, I'm planning to major in computer engineering. I do not know where yet. Super touchy topic right now, but I am so sorry that I wasn't able to be there with you today. I'm currently at badminton tryouts uh, for our school team. I Over the past four years, I've been working with Mr. Lucan and to be the driving force of the Test Innovation Fair and now the D128 STEAM Showcase, where I had originally started with reaching out to businesses to get their app ideas and things that they needed help with so that our, our amazing intelligent students were, would be able to help them and create smart app previews and minimum viable products to be able to show to these companies and show them to be able to work with them in the future and gain so many awesome networking skills that they can use in their future. 
And then my project this year is Ready, Set, Go, a social emotional tracker. It was so important because there have been so many changes with COVID and with the lockdown. And it was so important to me that everyone was staying mentally healthy, especially because I definitely struggle with anxiety. And I know a lot of people have been struggling with anxiety and other social and emotional problems due to the pandemic. And I wanted to mitigate that within school because we want everyone to try and succeed and do their best in school. Um, my project, again, inspired by everyone, all of my friends who I know have been super stressed lately. Um, the innovation grants recently, it has helped, the IOT has helped with the little servers that were part of our project with which Garish, my partner, will talk about. And as well as the arcade cabinet, which is so awesome to help create with Mr. Lucan, as well as this year, I'm using the innovation grant to create a vending machine from Arduino, which we're getting parts in as we speak. And I'm so excited to be building that because it just pushes me further within the realm of computer science. And I'm so excited to be a woman in STEM and to be doing all of this with the help of Mr. Lucan and the whole computer science program. Thank you so much. And I'm so sorry again that I wasn't able to be there with you today. Citizenship Award and the National uh, Committee of Women in Technology Award. Um, and then I won some awards, but we'll keep moving on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, our in person presentation was really, really fun. We had it uh, in December, and a handful who was attended that? Ooh, yeah. So good. Um, <laughs> And then we had a lot of amazing judges from a bunch of different, um, div different uh, local businesses. Good stuff. Yep, CW, Tina Jones, she's amazing. Last summer, we made a really awesome uh, STEM program for middle school girls, specifically uh, young black girls. And it was just an awesome program. Good. Uh, she's my neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta get connections where you can. Okay. Um, yeah, and so now we want to honor, um, not only honor, but also I want to have them, each of these guys, won some cool prizes. And they're going to talk a little bit about kind of where they came from, what inspired them, and uh, things like that. So without ado, our first winner, Lawrence Zay. basically a uh, musical playback engine in Minecraft. And this idea actually came back to me, I think over like, eight years ago when I actually still played the game at all. <laughs> but you know, it's not often you get free reign to do whatever you want in a class and work on you know, any project you wanted. So I thought, you know, why not finish that idea I always had? And so that's what I did for my Steam Showcase project. Um, in essence, what I did is I took recordings of real players playing their instruments and created like, I think around like a hundred different samples of these you know, players playing their instrument. And I created the sample player that basically mapped them to notes. So the idea was that you know, any user could input any sheet of music and the program would automatically take these recordings of notes and kind of stitch them together with some math and you know, frequency stuff to create you know, a working piece of music and actually worked quite well. Um, I think the experience was very valuable to me. Um, it was quite a learning process. You know, I was diving into things that I've not really touched in you know, that long period of time where like, I haven't touched Minecraft in many years, but you know, I started learning it. Um, I think by the, by the end of the class, my classmates grew pretty tired of hearing <laughs> crazy noise about coming on my computer. Cause... You guys want to hear a sample? Yeah, sure. Can you click on the video? <laughs> if you've ever played Minecraft, what you're hearing right now is probably a familiar sound. Well, Cobalt can automatically generate and play back the song using some custom coding and a few pieces of mathematical trickery. Math is used to warp and change the frequency of samples, calculate which samples to play, how long to play them for, and how loud they should be played. And this is especially difficult due to Minecraft's limitations, which doesn't have many of the features that more common applications have. But do this. Where do you want to talk to ah, okay. So yeah, um, <laughs> pretty good experience. Um, I really enjoyed having the judges' feedback, especially they really, you know, talked to me about like future applications and how I, I could expand my project, um, which I am considering doing. So it was really nice, you know, listening to them. You know, I hope it could be a yearly thing. I think it'll be a pretty valuable experience for a lot of um, students who are interested in CS or you know, any other discipline that could be combined into this um, Steam Showcase. And I'm definitely not saying that because I want an iPad. 
<laughs> I think everyone you know, should keep doing this kind of thing. It's a really great experience. Yeah. Fortunately, George is from Libertyville. He actually has Tom in his video. <laughs> if you just want to click that and just show like 10 seconds of his video. George's uh, college visit got extended, so he couldn't make it today. Hi. He is awesome. I'm George Huber, though. and this is my project, um, The GIF Maker. He actually wrote it all started with a problem to where for the first meeting of coding counts, Libertyville's computer science club. I decided our presentation needed a little bit of spicing up. I decided to add a couple of handcrafted gifs that I had made from old photos of alumni and a flask back end. Um, then it uses Python image library to crop the uh root image into a bunch of subframes. Uh, it uploads so each of those to a removed background so API so that way they come back as clear PNGs. And then finally it spices them all together into one GIF that is then and Shana teamed up with Garish and Garish is going to talk a little bit about their project. Hello guys uh i work with my partner shana weinstein as you've seen before uh the project seems a, a little bit lackluster right now as it's an image and we don't have a demonstration as of right now but overall the project has been a very good experience since i think sophomore year i really wanted to get into electronics and see where that can get me and through this project there was definitely a creative struggle there were days that i almost gave up but i kept working through it developing a bit by bit and i seen that there are they, there's almost two shades of computer science one on the higher higher end and one on the lower end uh the lower end would work with the electronics while the higher end would be more the code and the logic itself so yeah uh, it was a really fun project my project was a uh a tracker that the teacher can send responses back and forth and gather responses. And a, the plan was for a student to have one tracker and the teacher to have another, and they would act as the client on the server. And the server, aka the teacher, can send the client a few questions. And through the, thing, uh, to, uh, through the touch sensors on the actual IoT board, uh, the students can send responses back. Um, I'm really happy about the how the innovation fair gave me this opportunity to use electronics and see where that can uh, let me go. And I hope that we have more opportunities to do things like this in the future, especially for the underclass. Thank you. One thing Barish is not telling you is these, oh, if you go back one side real quick, I'm sorry. These pieces of technology, first of all, we wrote an innovation grant for, they're called the Internet of Things. Uh, it's an Arduino where you connect them to the internet. And this is like post-college level work that Garish was working on. There's um, a previous um, guy who worked here, Kai, who tried to get into this stuff and he said, I just gave up, it was too hard. Um, it is really complex stuff in order to try to get these pieces of technology to work because there's more, like he was mentioning, there's languages like Python and stuff that a lot of us, we learn and it's easier because you can, it's more like English. His is very, uh, extremely complicated and he was able to get it actually to work, to get those to connect to each other. It took an immense amount of frustration. So. I, I just applaud them so much. All right, our last group here is Kiwoon Learning. All right. All right, so uh, becoming financially free, something that pretty much everyone in this room would probably wanna be, right? But here's the problem. A lot of times we, people don't have the platform to necessarily learn or understand investing or even the simple concepts of compound interest. So we want to create a platform where resources would be on one site. And so we've created educational content around eight to nine educational videos, as well as over a total of 60 to 65 videos on either just fundamental or technical analysis on either stocks, companies, or the overall economy. And so we wanted to include this into the simulation that we built into. Jackie and Tim will get a little more into this later, but essentially we want to replicate how stocks are traded in real life and essentially show people essentially a learning process so they have a fundamental understanding, essentially how to learn and how to where to start. 
Hi, my name is Jackie Lim, I'm a current junior at VHHS. This website that you see right here, uh, at least, was custom, <laughs> was custom coded by Tim Arsentiev and I through the TypeScript and Java frame stack. We went for a contemporary aesthetic design with plenty of fun colors and waves and bold fonts to really draw the user's attention. Right now, most of our website is complete with a functional stock simulator capable of trading any stock, mutual fund, or cryptocurrency even. I personally handled all of the website design, while Timur handled all of the backend systems design. Hi, my name is Timur Sentiev, and I did the server for Kingwin Learning. Now, obviously, creating a stock simulator is not something you can just look up in Google. It's really more complicated than that. And because of that, it took us a lot of months, years, especially outside of class, doing this work and using C Sharp and ASP.NET Core which is outside of the APCSA and outside of the school curriculum, we were able to create this excellent application that is able to not only create simple buy or sell orders, but as well as mutual bonds, all that complicated financial stuff that not a lot of people know. So yeah, it was also a great learning experience for me, for Jackie, for Caleb and all our other members as forming a business and being business leaders. Thank you. That's it. <laughs> you want a picture? They want a yeah. picture. Yeah. Absolutely. Very glad it did. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Oh, 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 all right, we are going to turn it over to our student school board representatives for their reports. Okay, I guess I'm starting. Okay, so the VHHS Academic Resource Center has taken advantage of the new Wednesday flex schedule to implement their new SAT prep program. Sessions go on Wednesdays from 8 to 9.25 a.m. and any student can come and go as they please. The ARC has decided to take its tutors who feel that they were successful on standardized testing and have them help their peers by giving them advice and covering topics that they were particularly strong on. Students who walk in are presented with a buffet of options at their disposal, like practice tests, commonly missed questions, and Khan Academy practice. According to Marcello Gossaining, an SAT ARC tutor, there were around 49 students who joined a session last week, and most of them went to work on their own or in groups. Coffee and donuts are also being provided in the space as a way of making the ARC a more popular hangout spot among students. Juniors can use this opportunity to prepare for the practice SAT on March 5th in person or on March 12th virtually. On Thursday, February 3rd, Backlight Theater Company had the opening night for the Diary of Anne Frank. Everyone involved had worked for months to get this production together, and the actors recalled how much of an impact this story could have in the modern day and age. Megan Rakers, who played Anne, talked about the recent anti-Semitism that's been consistently popping up around the world, especially with society comparing quarantine, vaccinations, and mass mandates to the Holocaust. After stepping in these characters' shoes and researching their experiences, the cast wanted people to take a step back and realize the gravity of their situation compared to COVID-19 and to reflect on that. The show ended up being a success with nearly sold out shows and a very emotional crowd reaction. With this production taking place before masks became recommended at D128, the cast was considering wearing clear face shields to more clearly express emotions for the production. However, some didn't feel comfortable and the cast as a whole chose to use the black masks instead. February is Black History Month and VHHS's Black Student Union has been taking the chance to organize some fun activities and celebration. A weekly trivia competition has been posted on the bulletin board for all students to participate in. They ask questions about certain empowering black leaders and use the space to educate the school 
on lesser known but equally powerful African Americans. A video was also released last week showcasing students of all different races talking about the importance of Black History Month and what it means to them. Black Student Union also met up with the Libertyville BSU students on February 17th to talk about each other's experiences with Superintendent Denise Herman. Leslie Ann Benjamin, who attended the event, said, it gave the Black students from VHHS a chance to bond with the Black kids from LHS without the overlooming conversation about race that usually happens when we join forces. It gave me an opportunity to be free, to look around the room and see people that look like me and have gone through similar struggles. It was exhilarating to finally not be the only Black person in a room. And now, Kevin. Hello, everyone. So February was a pretty interesting month when it comes to masks. So at the start of the month, we had uh, protesting uh, uh, in the front of our school where students refused to wear masks uh, into the school. Those massless students were brought into the West Gym to have a conversation with Dr. G and other staff members. One of the, pro one of the protesters, Michael Collins, uh, said to me that the conversation was peaceful and it was nice to have someone listen uh, to what they were saying in a respectful manner. Fortunately, uh, the protests did not disrupt the school days. Uh, school was able to go on just like every other week. Uh, and the protesters who refused to wear masks were asked to stay in the West Gym um, and uh, zoom into their classes or they can take a mental health day. Um, on February 18th, VHHS got an email uh, that masks will now be recommended, not required. That morning, Dr. G spoke on the intercoms to address the situation to the student body. Since then, the school has continued to just, just be normal. Um, no, one, no one is pressuring each other to keep on the masks or take them off. Overall, the whole student body is being respectful to uh, every student that's making their mask decisions. Um, um, for me, I've seen a lot of people that will um, go walk into a classroom and will kind of like feel the room. And if they know that people are more sensitive about the topic, they'll put on the mask and be respectful. And other times, if it's not, if it's more loose, they will take it off and do what they see fit. Um, also, teachers are being very respectful. Um, I lead a senior class for um, PE and my freshman uh, class, Mr. Uh, the teacher, Mr. McCallie, sat us down the first day and talked about um, the whole mass situation. He said that, like he said, he said he's like vaccinated, all those stuff, but he said he's going to respect the students that still need, who want to wear the masks, and he will only remove his mask once everyone in the gym class is okay with that and, or has all their masks off. So, and I know other teachers are like this and other teachers are taking them off, but again, no one is being frustrated at the fact that the teachers don't have them on or have them off at like everything's going normal, which is pretty nice. Um, sports updates have kind of already been covered, but I'm just going to go through those again. Um, the dance team placed 11th in state, which is very good. Shout out Layla, that's my little sister. Um, <laughs> uh, cheer team placed ninth. Uh, Livy Tron uh, was the first freshman uh, to win and uh, be first place for the uh, IHSA vault champion. Um, Annika Chuddy, uh, a sophomore, uh, plays fifth in the all around and third on beam. Again, phenomenal. And the overall gymnastics team placed second. Uh, I know we're so close. We haven't won at all yet, <laughs> but I, I, I have it coming soon. Um, Ethan Fua for swimming. He placed 21st um, for the 100-yard breaststroke and 24th for the 200 IM. And Kevin Schumacher placed 20th for diving. Um, <laughs> congratulations to our VHHS art department uh, and several students who earned uh, recognition. VHHS students, Alina Revinskaya, uh, Sasha Agafanova, sorry if I mispronounced your name, uh, and Sophia Kim, who, were submi uh, who submitted portfolios to the, uh, uh, to the senior portfolio competition. Uh, they received tuition scholarships this year uh, through the IHSAE Art Connect Ed uh, opportunities. The Northern Regional uh, Expedition, uh, the uh, best of the best show featuring 500, um, 500 works of art across eight district um, categories uh, competed. Uh, these students are um, representing our school and it is Ben Evans, uh, Gabrielle DeLeon, Haley Rupert, uh, Jill Lensconi, sorry, uh, and uh, Z Kong. Overall, just amazing job. And I know, again, we talked about the Special Olympics and then their um, involvement, but I'm gonna talk about the other Special Olympics that was going on, the basketball team, the D128 Storm. Um, our Special Olympic team had an overall great season. I actually came to a lot of those games. I really enjoyed them. Um, 
um, a Vernon Hills and Libertyville combined program in a basketball team um, for the Special Olympics. There was a unified team where it was uh, Special Olympic players as well as other students from VHHS. And there was a more traditional team where it was only Special Olympic athletes. Um, and I, again, like I said, I had the opportunity to watch the uh, unified team play and I was overall just genuinely impressed. Um, one of the in one of the games I uh, I attended, um, a freshman Ben Peterson who is on the Special Olympic team, uh, traditional and unified, dropped twenty seven points and seven three pointers. Wow. Our varsity key team can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> that, that. That was ridiculous. I was watching and just was in awe. It was amazing to watch, and that was the reason I came back for game after game. It was again I just like loved it. Uh, sadly, uh, they lost in the regional finals in a triple overtime, really close battle between Hoff and the States, uh, 75 to 77. Again, I would like to give a huge shout out to Mr. Morello and all the other coaches on this team. It was a pleasure to watch and everyone, uh, everyone on the court seemed to have an amazing time. Okay, so just as us seniors thought the co stressful college process was over, all of our scholarship due dates are just around the corner. Many, if, and if not all, of us seniors are currently working on applying for as many scholarships as we can find. There are so many for all of us to do, choosing from the ones from our school, outside organizations, or even through specific colleges. But Mrs. Belito and Ms. Wheel have been a big help to all of us with helping us find these scholarships, reminding us of deadlines, and throughout the whole submitting process. Last Friday, we had our turnabout assembly. It was so great to see all the students in the gym and cheer on our amazing sport te sports teams, the staff for students basketball game, and so much more. Students also had the option to watch the assembly on, from the cafeteria TVs if they felt uncomfortable being in the gym with other students not wearing masks. And this Saturday, we also had our turnabout dance. We had a record, num record number of turnabout tickets sold with nearly 700 in total, and all the students had so much fun. The roller skating and dip and dots were a huge hit with all the students, and overall, it was a very successful night. The new flex periods have been very helpful to all students. Since so many of us are involved with things like sports, clubs, AP science classes, and so much more, it's really hard to find time to meet with teachers. I personally have used the new flex period to either catch up on homework or meet with my teachers, and it's helped me manage my time a lot better. Last Thursday, we had our annual blood drive and the turnout was amazing. So many people signed up and made an appointment, but there was also a large amount of walk-ins. There were so many people eager to help that they had to eventually stop letting in walk-ins. And I personally chose to donate for the first time and it was a really cool experience. I was really nervous all day. And I was like, so I just like was talking to people who had done it before. And I was like talking with my family, but I'm so glad that I did it because all the people working there made me feel so comfortable and made the process very smooth. All right. Um, <clears throat> these past couple of weeks have been chock full of excitement for Liverville High School students. Starting two weeks back, Student Council created a rock, paper, scissors tournament to kickstart our winter dance festivities, with every student getting beads to wager against other students. The students with the most beads by the assembly got to play in front of the entire school. Dr. K was also a participant and made to the championship round, so it's pretty intense. Uh, students and teachers got really into it playing at every possible moment. Really fun to see, and uh, they did get a little competitive. It, sometimes it had to be toned down a little bit. <laughs> then the week leading up to the winter dance, our student council arranged extremely fun spirit days that allowed for tons of student creativity. The fan favorite had to be anything but a backpack day, which needed some guidance from our administration, but <laughs> we saw everything from recycling bins to laundry baskets for students to hold their books and everything in between. Um, finally, our week ended with an electric black light assembly full of competition games and cheer and dance routines. The, uh, the assembly was extremely fun and students were given free glow sticks and other sort of items to help make the experience all the more cooler. So it was a pretty unique experience. Finally, the dance took place on Saturday with a packed gym. I don't have the specifics on numbers, but just from my looks of it, it was one of the most packed ever and silent disco, which is quickly turning to a fan favorite. Uh, clearly as seen earlier, students might've had too much fun dancing the night away. <laughs> <laughs> students I talked to were so grateful for all the hard work that teachers and students put into making it such a memorable week. 12 four. Wow. That's pretty wow. impressive. Quite the night. Uh, moving on to the classroom, <laughs> students are getting more and more comfortable with new grading practices that I've mentioned 
being used by many teachers. First semester included much trial and error with teachers needing to change how they approached the, the new grading practices. And as we moved on to the start of second semester, every student is feeling much more comfortable with it, knowing and understanding what is expected from them in the class, which is so important. Like Vernon Hills, our Libertyville has started flex days on Wednesdays to aid teachers and students with a new retake policy. Uh, the, the flex days provide a time for much needed uh, test taking, retaking, or going over content and shortens our class periods. A representative example of 40 students from every grade showed that students are overwhelmingly in favor of these days, using it for a multitude of reasons and different things. Students don't need to have to sacrifice lunch or come in extremely early to school or just pack their schedule. And same with teachers, they're allowed to have a lot more time. And uh, students are able to sleep in or do homework if they don't need to go in for tests or go out to breakfast. It's just great overall and kind of breaks up the week for us. And then on a fun note, uh, this past week, uh, our students and staff had a charity basketball game in which I heard I was not able to attend. It cost $3 and all of the proceeds were donated, but the teachers did in fact dominate the students and I heard it was not even close. So <laughs> I'll pass it on to Ryan now. <laughs> Um, as winter sports are winding down, Libertyville's teams and individuals have been very successful in all areas. Uh, so I'll talk about some of the sports we haven't heard about yet. Uh, the dance and cheer teams both made it down to the state competition, dance placing six and cheer placing 17. Both performances took place during the school day, and they were both streamed in the studio theater where staff and students gathered to watch. Um, I unfortunately couldn't watch dance because I was performing, but I watched cheer and it was amazing to see the amount of support from the crowd cheering every time the team landed a stunt or a flip. Girls basketball won the regional championship with a win over prospect, but ended their season with a loss to Stevenson. Congrats to them on a great season. The boys team is advancing in the playoffs with their win against Warren last Friday. Uh, not only did they win the regional championship, but they also set the school record for most wins in a season. They're playing Stevenson this Wednesday in the sectional semifinals, so congrats and good luck to them. The girls' bowling team was undefeated in this regular season, and they placed 14th in the state tournament. They raised $800 to the Save a Pet charity, which was the largest, largest donation to the organization to the state, so amazing job. On February 16th, the athletic department held a peak performance mental strength workshop that athletes, parents, and coaches could all attend. This workshop focused on obstacles to athletic performance and the mental skills to overcome these obstacles to be a successful athlete. It was available both in person and on YouTube. One aspect that made this event really impactful were that there were speakers who were performance coaches, but also speakers who were former Libertyville and collegiate athletes. Uh, it provided a great opportunity to hear from both people really knowledgeable in the science of it and people who have been in athletes' shoes and succeeded using that performance advice. The event walked through subjects like mental performance, what it means to grow a resilient mind, and practices and steps athletes can take to grow a resilient mindset and overcome any mental or physical obstacles they're experiencing. I thought that this was super helpful in providing an easy pathway for both coaches and athletes to work together and stay on the same track in improving their mental performance and in turn their physical performance. One aspect of our athletic program that I wanted to talk about today is the Wildcat of the Week. This was brought to us by Mr. Woods in 2018, where coaches select athletes every week that they want to recognize for their successes, hard work, or anything they feel deserves special recognition. These students that are chosen get to hear a short message from their coach about why they were chosen. They receive an award and a t-shirt from the athletic office, and they're also posted online. This is really important to many athletes at the school because it provides a validation of hard work that may typically go unnoticed. I feel like this tradition has really made a difference for our student athletes and helps create and continue the positive championship culture we have here at LHS. In terms of masks, I'll be brief because we're pretty similar to Vernon Hills, but Friday, February 18th was our first day that we went mass recommended. Uh, with the abruptness of the ruling, there was some confusion the first day. However, after the weekend, it seemed that everyone was clear on the rules. In my experience, we've seen about half of Libertyville students wearing masks and the other half choosing not to wear masks. Generally, students have been very respectful of each other's choices. And similar to Vernon Hills, uh, teachers are very respectful of students and only will take their masks off if their students are comfortable with that. 
after a week, uh, the school seems very much normal and not a lot has changed. LHS has had so much happening over the last month, from fine arts events taking place, displaying the effort and time students have put into the pieces they perform, to the winter dance every student was so excited for, as they mentioned. The winter play was held on February 11th and 12th. The play was titled Picnic, and personally, I enjoyed seeing my friends perform who could not stop talking about all the fun rehearsals that they were working on to put on the show. I'm not kidding. Every single day, they were talking about this. I have heard from a few that were in the play and particularly Nadia Simpson said that it was a more laid back than it was in the fall musical, which is also a huge event at LHS. They liked that it felt more easygoing and less stressful. LHS's band held their winter concert on February 17th. The winter concert is one of the biggest performances of the year and so much time went into planning and organizing the concert for friends and families to see. I have a few friends that performed and they said that it was a big accomplishment for them, especially for the seniors seeing all the progress they had made since freshman year. Cabaret was also performed on February 23rd. Cabaret is a more fun concert for chor choral as well. The theme was decades and everyone dressed as their favorite era and time. Me and my best friend Kaylee Kinnist dressed as 2000s, looking like we just came out of Clueless. <laughs> Students not only got to perform as a whole choir, but also had solos, duets, and trios to show the audience. Spider-Man also invaded the concert when Cleftos, one of the separate singing groups focusing on our basses and tenors in the choir, performed their performance that they had worked on separate outside of school. Orchestra will also be holding their winter concert on March 3rd, and I'm sure so many are excited to see what new winter theme pieces our orchestra has to show. Within the winter orchestra is a solo and ensemble, which is being held on March 5th, where students prepare their own performances either by themselves or with a small group of friends to show a more individual aspect of our or orchestra. Finally, our jazz band is having their winter concert on March 9th. Our jazz band is our musical ensemble for more jazz-based music. I was not able to attend, but my dad went, and being a 60s baby, absolutely loved the music that they played. So in conclusion, lots of winter concerts and lots of students putting their talent, effort, and time into music that they love. LHS's fine arts program, whether it's within our bands, orchestra, theater, or chorals, is so greatly appreciated, not only by students, but by teachers, moms, dads, aunts, uncles, cousins, and well, you get the point. I would like to thank the board for all the effort that they put in through such a hard time to have our students have laugh, lifetime last, sorry, lifetime lasting memories such as these, not only between their peers, but with their directors, teachers, leaders, and with their families. Thank you so much. Thank you. Nice job. And I will say that we also are incredibly proud of the quality of the fine arts, both at Liberty Villa and Vernon Hills High School. We are patrons and fans as well. Um, and we're very proud of the quality of the work that comes out of both of those departments. So thank you for highlighting that for us. Um, also want to say that, um, you know, many of you sitting here have accomplishments uh, that you've made um, academically, as well as in athletics and fine arts. And we are so pleased that you continue to share your thoughts and your insights about what's going on in the buildings with us. So um, good luck, LHS basketball. We look forward to uh, hearing good news. Um, and before I conclude the um, president's report, I do want to um, thank everybody that has come out for public comment this month, uh, both at committee and tonight, especially the students. Uh, we heard from them in person as well as via email. Um, I also uh, wanted to clear up just a couple of things that uh, were, were incorrect. Um, you know, we did have people uh, wondering why we didn't have a special meeting, which we didn't feel was required since the administration wasn't recommending any changes to our culture of care plan before the committee meeting. So we waited until then to hear the recommendations. Um, we also are very appreciative of the district leadership team for their careful consideration with our legal counsel as we worked through the litigation where we were a named defendant. Um, I think their patience was rewarded and we're very appreciative that they have worked with the CDC guidance that was just recently updated on Friday, as well as ISBE and IDPH and Lake County Health Department recommendations to develop the metrics that they are gonna to present to us later on. 
Um, also want to make it clear that no one suggested that we couldn't motion for a vote at committee. We noted that it wasn't our normal procedure to vote when it wasn't indicated on the agenda. And since there were no changes being made that we needed to vote on, you'll note that all the way back to the beginning of COVID, there was only one time where we did take a vote during a regular meeting. That was to determine the date to uh, begin our hybrid program. Um, since before that and after that, uh, we have been taking recommendations from the administration without voting. Um, you will note that we don't have a scheduled vote tonight. We're going to hear the recommendations and the plan that's presented. Um, but a vote uh, will not be required. It doesn't mean that we're not clear on Robert's rules. Of course, we could roll call vote, but our policy does not require us to do that. And our procedure throughout COVID has been to listen to the rec recommendation of the previous administration, as well as the current administration, as we develop our, uh, our guidance, our mitigations, and our metrics based solely on the recommendations of the CDC, ISBE, IDPH and Lake County Health Department. Um, also do want to say a big thank you to Dr. K and Dr. G as they worked with students who were exercising their civic right to demonstrate. Um, there was a lot of extra work that went into making sure that went smoothly for the, stu for the students that were protesting as well as the students who were not so um, very much in recognition of all the extra work that you put in to make sure that that went smoothly, because I, I think in no small part of your effort, our teachers continued to teach and our students continued to learn. So thank you. Um, yeah. And without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Herman for her superintendent's report. Thank you very much. And again, it was wonderful to hear all of your reports, students, and I just want to remind you Thursday night, we have a stakeholder group meeting. So I hope you have that on your calendar and I look forward to seeing you then. Um, there's two of those, right? Yes, there's one this Thursday and then April 20th. So thank you for trying to make both of them if it works for your calendar. I get to start with sharing some good news. And these are things that are in addition to all the good news that our board reps and that our principals have already recognized. So I'll start with LHS senior Ryan McCrory. He's been named one of, she, excuse me, she, she, <laughs> sorry. She right here in, in our presence has been named one of more than 5,000 candidates in the 20, 2022 US Presidential Scholars Program. Wow. Candidates were selected from nearly 3.6 million students, so that's 5,000 out of 3.6 million uh, expected to graduate from high school in 2022. Inclusion in the Presidential Scholars Program is one of the highest honors bestowed upon a graduating high school senior. Scholars are selected on the basis of superior academic and artistic achievements, leadership qualities, strong character, and involvement in community and school activities. Approximately 600 semifinalists semi will be named in early April and the finalist in May. And Ryan, we wish you the best of luck. Okay. Next we have, uh, and we heard from uh, Shana this evening, Shana Weinstein was named an honorable mention in the National Center for Women in Information Technologies 2022 Award for Aspiring uh, Aspirations in Computing. The award recognizes 400 high school students from 43 states um, and all um, oversee military bases. This year's 40 winners and 360 honorable mentions were selected from more than 3,500 amazing, talented young applicants. The program recognizes students in grade nine through 12 who are women, genderqueer or non-binary for their aptitude and aspirations in technology and computing as demonstrated by their computing experience, computer related activities, leadership experience, tenacity in the face of barriers to access and plans for post-secondary education. Next, senior Tavish Sharma was named a 2022 Prudential Emerging Visionary for bringing power and vision and meaningful change to his community. 
as one of 25 young people from across the country selected for this year's inaugural class, Tavish will receive $5,000 in funding, as well as an invitation to participate in an award summit. Select winners will be eligible to participate in a pitch off where a grand prize winner will receive an additional $10,000 in funding. Um, Tavish created Hunger Solve Hunger Core, a free mobile app that connects food pantries and soup kitchens with members of the wider community. As food insecurity rose during the pandemic, Tavish realized many people wanted to help but didn't know how to. His free Solve Hunger app connects users to food banks and soup kitchens in their communities, allowing them to contribute money or food. Food banks can also post signups for volunteer shifts and fundraisers. Solve Hunger Corps now serves over 85,000 people through 50 food banks, pantries, and kitchens in 13 states across the country. And finally, we get to re recognize one of our staff. VHHS CTE Department Supervisor Lynn Benson has been named Illinois Association of Career and Technical Education Administrator of the Year. She received the honor at the awards night celebration held as part of their annual conference held on February 17th. As a recipient of this honor, she now advances as a candidate to be considered for the National um, Administrator of the Year Award. Among the nomination letters submitted by her CTE team, it was noted that Lynn truly believes in the work of her teachers and values them, knowing their craft so student learning is always at the forefront. Being student-centered always drives her decision-making and she is willing to support teachers in whatever way possible so we can all strive for student success. So congratulations. And next on the superintendent's report, we have our COVID update. And I want to again, acknowledge Bryant Kelly for all the work he's done in preparing this presentation and the quick response to integrate our uh, announcement from the CDC on some changing uh, parameters over the weekend. So I'll turn it over to Bryant and students. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, you can start with the first slide there. So again, just a reminder on our mitigation measures, our overall goal as we ended you know, our last meeting, which we stated since the beginning of um, our culture of care um, in August is to protect the health of students, teachers, and staff so in-person learning can resume as safely as possible. Our guiding principle is that we'll align our COVID response plan to public health recommendations from the CDC IDPH, Illinois State Board of Education, and Lake County Health Department. So I want to first start with just our current, you know, just a reminder of what our current metrics are. Again, high vaccination rates, um, which are good. Um, and if you look at our number of cases for students at both schools, maybe, yeah, thank you. Uh, as you can see, it's really dropped down. And again, this was updated again as of last week. So these are, you know, current again, where our cases have really decreased for students. The next one, our cases have decreased for staff. You know, part of the reason also is the ongoing prevention strategies that we have had going at both schools. We will continue to promote our vaccinations, booster shots. We'll maintain physical distancing as much as possible. We still are looking at close contact tracing by our nursing staff. Um, we're in communication all the time with the Lake County Health Department on positive cases among students and staff. So when we report the cases online to our we also have to put that into a system by the Lake County Health Department. Um, hand washing, respiratory etiquette will be continue to be encouraged with, again, appropriate cleaning supplies available in all the classrooms, uh, locker rooms. Again, robust daily cleaning in all our facilities will continue. Um, and HVAC um, improvements, again, were made across the district and we'll continue to monitor at, at both uh, Libertyville and Vernon Hills High School. Some of our updated exclusion quarantine, again, contact tracing practices continued, staff parents notified when uh, they're exposed to a, a positive case, but close contacts will not be excluded from school um, unless their symptoms develop. Likewise, if Student staff exhibit symptoms, they should 
remain home, remain at home. If they come to school and they exhibit symptoms, they'll be sent home. Um, if somebody tests positive for COVID, again, they'll be excluded from school for the five days. And again, day zero, and then it's five days, and then they return on um, day six. So that's, again, the current guidance from CDC. If any of this changes from any of our you know, health departments, we will continue to update that. Which brings us to our latest update from <laughs> CDC, which came out Friday night. Mm -hmm. So as we were asked at the last meeting, the, com the committee meeting was to look at some decision-making and metrics. And so we started consulting with the local Lake County Health Department, um, other schools on what they were doing. Um, and obviously a shift happened Friday night when CDC released some of their updated guidance. So I wanna go over that updated guidance to make sure you understand what that is and how we maybe can incorporate that into our schools. Uh, so from the CDC, their COVID-19 community levels. Um, and when they say community, it's really county levels. And if you go on the CDC website, you can click on and see where your county levels are at. Um, and so what they do is they look at um, the COVID-19 admissions per 100,000 in the past seven days for the hospital, the percent of staffed inpatient beds occupied by COVID-19 patients. So again, so that is incorporating the hospitalization in the area. And then they're looking at the total new COVID cases per 100,000 in the past seven days. So if you remember going back to CDC, their previous guidance, they had four categories and it was only based off of cases per 100,000 and positivity. So that positivity has gone by the wayside and what they're saying for their new community levels is they're incorporating the hospitalization and then the cases per 100,000. Okay, some of the other guidance that came out and we'll talk about that is masks recommended on school buses and mini buses and then in driver's ed vehicles. So that guidance also came out on Friday night that school transportation. Um, again, we had to really read into it and I, I hope we're reading it right too, that other public transportation buses, they people are still required to wear masks, but school buses now you are not required to wear masks. And so that's where we're changing that. Communication will be coming out this evening then and we'll make that change. So that's our recommendation is to change. And again, you know, part of this is because it came out late Friday night um, and, you know, um, wanted to digest all of this and read through it. So the next one is, um, the next slide shows the chart that I just went over, which really shows their new level. So they have a low, a medium, and a high. And Lake County is in a low level. So what, again, so the, the, the furthest left of the chart is they first look at the, um, the cases per 100,000. And if it's fewer than 200, it'll be in the upper two bands. If it's more than 200, they go into the, upper, the, the, upper two, uh, the lower two bands or the higher end. Then from there, they look at the uh, COVID admissions per 100,000 for hospitalization and the staff and patient. And that's where they determine where your county is at, low, medium, or high. So there's kind of three things that they're looking at for your community. So where does that leave us and for schools? And so some of the mitigation for us, we also consult with our local health department. So Illinois Department of Public Health says schools should work with their local public health officials to determine which prevention strategies are needed in addition to required strategies by evaluating local levels of community transmission and local coverage, vaccine coverage. Lake County says that we should also use our local school metrics to make mitigation decisions. Um, but if there's any significant changes in any measures that we use at our schools, we should consult with Lake County. So we should not be making decisions without consulting with Lake County. So does that mean if we had all of a sudden 100 cases in the building, that would be a local decision. That's not a county decision because a hundred cases here wouldn't necessarily affect so, the county metrics. So that, so that is, so when you look at the community um, metrics from the CDC, that's the county. So there could be pockets of the county that could be higher. And so what Lake County is saying, that that's why you should also take into consideration your own metrics because they could be different than the county. 
But anytime that we have any surges in cases or anything, we should be talking to the county. So we should. So be, we wouldn't be making that decision unilaterally as no, a school board. We would be no, talking. To, we would be talking to the county. The county and, as and a involving of them. Noticing an increase in our building. Yes. Right. So that leads really to our decision making. Then you know what we should be doing. So we should be utilizing the new CDC COVID community levels. And I, I think it's a little misleading because it says community levels, that's really Lake County. Next slide. Oh yeah. Um, sorry, I'm looking at the slides in front of me, they changed <laughs> on my paper. Um, so the, the community levels, and again, that's a little bit misleading because it is all of Lake County and there could be something happening in another part of the county that's different than ours. So that means really, what else do we do? We should utilize our D128 student staff COVID cases. That is currently been reported since August on our website, and I will continue to you know report that. And so you can see that data basically from the beginning of school. If you click on any of the tabs, you could see every single week. And so I'll continue to update, try to do that usually at the end of the day or the next morning from the previous day, and then update it for the week. Um, again, in our decision making, we should consult with Lake County Health Department if there is any changes in the community levels from CDC. So if that green, that low level changes, or we have any surges in cases, we should be communicating with Lake County. Um, and again, this came out Friday and Lake County has another update with superintendents this week. So, um, you know, we're going off of what they told us before um, and we'll continue to work with them. So what maybe could a layered mitigation decision-making look like? So if we look at our next slide, for example, in a um, low community level, the green recommend, we're masking recommended, testing, we still have point of care testing. So point of care testing is that somebody comes down, they're not feeling well, they can get a Binax rapid test from our nurse. We are still weekly testing our unvaccinated staff. If the community uh, jumps up to a medium level, now again, before we say we're gonna go to that level, we're gonna look in combination with our D128 data. So if the community level jumps up to medium, but we don't aren't exhibiting the cases, we should be talking to the county and say, I know the county is moving to medium, but do we need to move any other mitigations at that point? But let's say we moved up to that level, things that you could increase would be, you're still doing point of care testing, you're still doing weekly testing of unvaccinated staff, and you could add on weekly testing of unvaccinated students and extracurriculars. Looking at what we've done in the past, some of the testing. If the county moves up to high, so the, the they call an orange level, um, again, it doesn't mean we're moving to high. It doesn't mean we're moving to that step. So I don't want people to read into it because again, we would use that in combination with any of our D128 data and we would be consulting with the health department. What are some things that we could do? We could look at masking, whether it's situational masking or universal masking. Situational masking might be where you, you know you have larger groups gathering together, or you have cases where you know you, you, you've seen a spike in an area of the school, and you could do situational masking. Um, some of the testing that you could increase again, you could do point of care testing, which we're still doing, weekly testing of unvaccinated staff. You're kind of layering each time. The next one is weekly testing of unvaccinated uh, students, and then you know, the other one is testing all students attending, you know, larger events um, where they're gathering together. So looking at layering the testing as you go, as you move up, masking again, as you move up, none of these decisions would be made though, without consulting, um, you know, with the health department and, you know, looking at, you know, what we could do. Um, so I'll go to the summary page and then open up for any questions. So again, we'll continue to monitor our school data. So that's not stopping because I, th I think it's important still to see what our data is doing. Um, and again, that'll be updated at the end of each week. Again, it's currently reported on D128 website. We'll communicate with the Lake County Health Department at any surges in COVID-19 cases. 
we'll consult with the Lake County Health Department and any changes that we have in our mitigation measures. Um, you know, the, obviously the two biggest ones you're looking at are masking and testing. Um, everything else we'll continue to do, cleaning, um, you know, in, in the uh, hand washing, respiratory etiquette, you know, um, we'll try to remind people that, the, again, monitor our HVAC improvements. And again, as we're moving, so we're coming off a of winter season. And so we're moving into, you know, spring. And so Mark and his team will monitor our HVAC and any changes, you know, in, in that. Um, if there's any changes, again, in mitigations at either schools, how we'll communicate it. We will communicate it, you know, to, you know with the board and then uh, through our um, email system to all families. Um, again, the transportation masking updates we are gonna send out, you know, this evening. Um, and then we would update our culture of care with any changes. <clears throat> and again, this is all, you know, new with CDC coming out Friday night. So, um, you know, we'll consider to, we'll, uh, continue to consult with Lake County Health Department, um, you know, on, um, you know, their recommendations. Thank you for putting that together. It's yeah. been a moving target. But I, my question is, can you help us from speaking to the attorneys? First of all, were there any named defendant districts who did not participate in the appeal? Do you know that? There were 104. Yeah, you have to speak yeah, up. Bring your mic down. Oh. Were there any named defendant districts that did not participate in the appeal? Did not participate. I. So I, we they appealed the original restraining order. Were there any districts who left the litigation and did not participate in that appeal? I believe there were some districts that did not participate in the appeal, but whatever ramifications of the appeal still apply to all the named districts. And again, you know, what the school districts were appealing was different than what um, like the governor and the attorney generals were appealing. I guess generally, like what is the status that we're getting from our attorneys of our ability to even make this? I mean, I, I think it's valid. Like if, we heard yesterday, the Supreme Court chose not to heal, hear the appeal, but sent it back down to the circuit court, right? So what are our attorneys telling us that we are in a position to be able to be doing as far as making decisions? We can, we can make, you can make local decisions in consultation with the health department. But then there, I mean, there's still other things to consider when, you know, you're looking at if you're instituting any masking or quarantining items, mandatory, you know. I don't know if that answers. Are there other questions about what we see in the presentation? I've, oh. No, I'm just gonna say thank you for the work on, on as Cara said, an ever moving target. And uh, I know this has been a lot of hours and a lot of communications with our local health department and getting people pressuring those organizations to give direction and give clear direction. So I do appreciate the information. No, you're, you're good. Uh, Brant, thank you. Obviously, wonderful, thorough data presented as always. And um, I think it is so wonderful to see the data moving in the direction that it is. I think personally, it's a sigh of relief um, that things are moving in the in the direction that they are. Um, these kids are getting a well-deserved break from masks if they you know, so choose. Um, I do have a question regarding exclusions and quarantines. There was a time, and forgive me for not having the specifics on hand, there was a time where our nurses had suspended notification of close contacts. Just for my knowledge, um, when did we reinstate that? Do you remember this time where it had gotten kind of wacky to track everyone down? Yeah. We didn't have the manpower. Yeah, so when we returned from break and then the number of cases in the building, if 
somebody was a, you know, vaccinated and didn't need to do tests to stay or didn't need to quarantine, that they weren't always notified, um, you know, that they were a, you know, in pro close proximity to somebody. So, you know, they weren't, a, they just weren't, they were sitting next to them, but they were vaccinated um, and the parents weren't notified at that. Right. But now, and we started that back up pretty, you know, a couple of weeks later. Once that. it became more manageable, I assume. Okay. Just wanted to be clear yep. on that. And then, um, oh, this part with, again, with um, quarantines and exclusions, it says students can return with the negative test. So this is if they're con confirmed positive. Um, negative test, I, I, do we need to be more specific in terms of what kind of test we expect? Does it have to be a PCR? Should so if be they have school? symptoms, they, it should be with a negative lab test. And I think that's written on our information that our nurses share with our parents on okay. the website. All right. Thank you. If they're, if they test positive for COVID and they sit out, they don't need to take a test to return after the five days. So they, they, they sit out quarantine as long as their symptoms are improving and it's after the five days. Okay. And then the mask would still be required for the full 10 after. We can't require the mask okay. for the full 10. We okay. can recommend having, you know, so the CDC says you should wear a mask from day six to 10 um, on return, but we can't require it. Okay. That. All right. Thank you. I have a question. Mm -hmm. When they come back after the five days, do they have to have a negative test or do they just come back? No, they don't need to have a negative test. So it's you, you do the quarantine um, and then your symptoms should be improving and fever free for 24 hours. So it's trusting them? Yes. Okay. Well, they quarantined yeah. for five days. Yeah. So it should have run its cycle. They would yeah. not necessarily need to test. I had a couple of questions. Uh, one is when you look at the situational um, mitigation, am I to understand that possibly you could have a situation where there are the metrics in one school are not great, whereas the other school are okay, and you could have more mitigations in one school and not the other? You could, yes. Okay. Um, the other thing is, as you mentioned, the weather improving. With the with the weather improving, um, are we looking at opening windows, letting kids back out for lunch and such? Um, I, I think that's our goal. That okay. I think that's our goal when it does warm up is to be able to have the lunches back. You know, we had um, the, the uh, Libertyville. You know, the courtyard available for students to go back outside as long as it's warm enough. Um, and the windows, you know, a lot depends too with. Um, the way our HVAC is set up is, you know, if you start opening the windows too much, then it, it causes an imbalance. So, but Mark and his staff will work with, you know, when that can happen. And the, the HVAC system does bring in outside ventilated air, but it depends on how much you bring in. So we've ramped up, like bring in more ventilated air, but when it's really cold, that's colder air you're bringing in. So it's harder. So you, so you get more ventilation, but then you lose on the ability to control the climate. So it's a little bit of a give and take and it's, Okay. Sometimes tough to find that balance, but I think in general, they've been able to do a good job keeping that balance. So that's what you meant by Mark is going to monitor. So, yep. so thank you for helping there. And my last question, I think, is uh, we should also address the social emotional needs of students who are stressed for whatever reason, whether whether they are masking or not masking or whatever is going on. I know we've got some emotional support type resources we've added. So I think we should add that to the plan of how are we helping different students that are wrestling with different types of events that are all related to what's going on. It's a good idea. That was all I had, thanks. Any other questions or comments about the plan? Okay. I, I want to apologize. It's been a long day. I've been up since 430. So I just, I, I think what I was trying to get to the point is we've discussed, I want to make sure that we're on the right side, that we even have the authority to be making these mitigations. And it seems clear to me, it, it seems clear that most of the mitigations that we're asking for are within our purview and are we, so 
you know, there's a question out there amongst the community. We've heard it. So from, I, I guess I'm asking you because we're not, we're not privy to what advice we're getting from the council that we feel that this is on the right side and we do have authority to be making these kind of decisions. So with the new CDC guidance just coming out Friday, and I, I know Denise is meeting with Lake County this week, so they have a meeting. So we haven't run that far end of it, but the current mitigations that we have in place, um, you know, there isn't any issues with it's, you know, when are the next steps? If we move to high transmission, you know, what can we do? You know, so we're still working on, on that piece. That's of it. All. So, I mean, yeah. before we move from yes. one system to the X, the next we will be looking yeah. at, is that even something that we have the authority to do? Yeah. Oh yeah. That's all. I mean, yeah. In a very convoluted way, that was no. what I was trying to get to. Uh, and I think, Clara, if I, in understanding your question, you're asking, do we have the legal authority in addition to the metrics, the health metrics? Right. Okay, thank you so much for all your questions and suggestions. Um, next, we have 10 freedom of information requests. So I'm going to just give the, a brief summary of each. Um, on January 26th, we received a request from Preston Deddy from Chicagoland Construction for information on bid results and tabulations. On February 4th, we received um, a request from Haro Gomez from the Chicago Land Laborers District Council on big bid results. Um, on February 8th, we received a request from Gabe Kaminsky from the Daily Wire requesting all district communication and emails regarding two mask protests on February 7th at Vernon Hills and Libertyville High School. On February 10th, we received um, a request from Kim Eckroat. Um, for information associated with the public officials surety bond requirements from Illinois. On February 10th, we received a request from Alma Miranda requesting information again related to the public officials surety bond required by Illinois and related information. On February 11th, we received a request from Marnie Navarro for copies of, again, our public officials surety bond um, required by the state of Illinois and related information. On February 14th, we received a request from Alma Miranda for invoices um, that we've received, or invoices from our lawyers for the timeline of December 1st, 2021 through February 28th, 2022. On the 16th, we received, it, we received a request from Alma Miranda requesting bank, bank statements from November 21st through February 22nd for our largest fund, the one that pays for everything. So I think that's the Ed Fund. Um, and then on February 18th, we received a quest, request from TJ Again, asking for electronic copies of our public official surety bonds from Illinois. And finally, on February 24th, we received from Nathan Michalik, um, Illinois Retired Teachers Association, information for all of our staff, teachers, administrator, nurses, counselors who are retiring this year. And then just for the record, we responded to all of those? all were responded to. Thank you. Some took as short as 15 minutes, some were as long as six hours. And that was noted in the board report. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Moving on to our consent, excuse me, moving on to our consent vote agenda. These are all items that were discussed at length at previous committee meetings. Um, so I'll be looking for a motion to uh, approve the consent vote agenda as presented. Move to approve the consent vote agenda. Second. Any discussion? Great, roll call vote, please. It's the first one of the night. Mm -hmm. Take your <laughs> Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. 
Hessel. Aye. Kulkarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Great. Motion passes. We move on to uh, Chairperson Batson for the Program and Personnel Committee report. Thank you very much. Our first item on the agenda is a series of, I think, 28 board policies. These are for a second reading and adoption. So what that means is we've actually discussed these. This is the fourth time they've come up uh, for discussion. Um, so this will be um, second reading and adoption of these policies. There were a couple minor adjustments that I know we made along the way, but these were discussed thoroughly in the uh, previous uh, committee meetings. So if we can have a, a motion, please. I move to adopt the board policies as stated. Second. Okay, any further questions, comments? I just wanna point out that I have no comments or questions. <laughs> We're disappointed. I'm a little disappointed. Noted. Yes. We don't even know you. He's the guy that keeps us on our toes. Okay, roll call please. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Kulkarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Motion passes. Second item on the agenda is a diligent corporation agreement. This is for Board Docs Pro, which is uh, something that will help us and the district manage our documents for our board meetings much more efficiently. So can we have a motion on this? I just have one comment. I actually could have used these today because <laughs> yeah. I was looking for something. I had to call Carol. She had to find it. And I'm like, Okay, real world example, this will be a very useful tool for mm -hmm. us as board members to, there's a lot of information and a lot of content that we go through, particularly in committee meetings. And I can only speak for myself, but I can't always remember everything. Sometimes I wanna re refer back to things that would be very um, helpful to have this. Yeah. So, and for the public and for everybody. Yes, I, mean, really, yeah. I will motion to approve mm -hmm. the contract as presented. And I will second. Okay, and, and I have a question. Okay. I, I yes. do have a question. Uh, there's an automatic 5% increase each year. I noticed in a bunch of the things that we're doing like our upcoming contract uh, for, um, the Hawthorne space and for our district office space, there's stepwise increases over the course, but it, just a flat 5%, is that normal? Is it reasonable? Is that what we expected? That's a, oh, okay. The, con the contract does call for a 5% increase each year. Yeah, I mean, the standards I've seen where I come from um, is 3% or less. Uh, if there is any way to negotiate this down and to below 5%, that would be more financially beneficial for us. So you're suggesting that we table this and not vote to approve it until we further negotiate it? Yeah. Or can we approve the, the because we're, what we're being asked for right now is the the initial purchase the first year, and we well it just says that it automatically right uh, renews every year. We have a month prior to the automatic renewal date in writing to tell them that we're not interested anymore. Right. Yeah, so we have an out. So this isn't committing us for the. We do. I guess what I'm saying is if, if we're signing up for a 10 year contract and they say 5% a year for the, right. the 10 years is a deal, because normally if we do it piecemeal year by year, it's going to be like eight or 9%. Well, then 5% is a good idea. But if the industry standard is 3%, then I'm questioning why is it 5%? Yeah. yeah, I would say just based on my experience in the last year, it ranges anywhere from three to, in some cases, 25 or more percent increases. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Do we have data that that's industry standard? I, I don't. That's why I'm asking the question because I'm not an expert. So my packet, I can't find this contract in my packet. Um, so I, it, yeah, I, I read it today. I can't calculate what the difference between 3% and 5% a year. It might not be significant is. on what 10 grand. On 10 yeah. grand. So yeah. if I could find, I, I, I wonder if somebody else would be able to do the math because I, I don't, I, my packet doesn't have this contract. 
I'm looking at the packet and I can't find it. But Don, you were comparing this to the other contracts that we will be approving. Yeah, they, they all have all stepwise have increases. Right. So it's, I think it's, that's why to me, it seems best. clearly normal. I just didn't calculate the percentage for all the other ones because those are just monetary. They don't they don't say what the percentage increase is. They say how, what the dollar amount increase is. I could have gone back and calculated, but I, I actually I didn't know that this would be a difficult question because I, I but I don't I don't have any experience with this. I just was surprised to see that it was a flat five percent, and I was asking if that's a good deal or not. I. My opinion is it's probably not a bad deal, but it's worth asking the question. But I think in terms of procedurally, we're asked to be, we're actually asked to approve $4,342.47, which is a prorated amount for the remainder this of year. this year. Right. Um, but as long as we approve that, then the administration has the ability to go ahead and enter into this agreement. But before they do that, they can ask that question and say, hey, and we bring this down. So it's and a all motion we've given amended? them is the approval to, to, to spend that if they feel it's appropriate. But, you know, we have that still the option of asking the question before the contract is, is, is signed and, and solidified. And we certainly would have to approve this every year following that, even though they say it automatically. It really doesn't. They right, give it's it over thirty grand. days out, so we would have to reapprove this the, the the price every year anyway, in some form. So, do I need to amend the motion? Is that because that, that's what I'm? Yeah. Do we amend the motion to say we're approving the forty three hundred for the remainder of the contract year, uh, and we'll have to have this conversation again when we get to a month prior to whenever this renews. renews. Well, practically, well, if we put the time into putting all the data into this database, are we really right. gonna not finish yeah. the contract? So yeah. I well, don't know I, that well we that's actually wanna, a very good point. Why would we approve something for a year and, that we're gonna invest a lot of time in if we're not committed? And this the is term? the industry standard for most public organizations to use. So I, okay. I, I do think it is a fairly standard uh, operating practice. Um, many of the districts that we, 73 that feeds into us uses this. Many other of our local um, neighboring districts use this same software program. Yeah. And my only comment was we're giving approval for them to mm -hmm. spend that, but they could ask before they give the company the signature to, to move forward. We could ask that question. All we're doing is allowing them, the administration, to, to make that question without putting it off another month so that we're losing that time to uh, to be able to potentially use this. Would that address your concern? Yeah, I mean, because it compounds, right? It's 5% compounds next year. So over time, maybe it's not much now, but in, in 10, 15 years, it, it can start adding up. That's right. And I think um, the point that it's something that we invest time in, yeah. the, the more robust the mm -hmm. data is, the better it is okay. for the board, the administration, and the public to use it as an archive. So um, I think as long as that procedurally addresses your concerns, I think we'll have the motion and the second stand. And um, if, if there's more discussion we can certainly discuss it further otherwise we can i mean this doesn't commit the district to this but it authorizes the district for this before you sign the actual paperwork let, let's let's see if we can get any reduction in your annual increase okay any further comments or questions okay can we have a uh, roll call please Carmichael. Aye. Grumke. Aye. Essel. Aye. Kolkarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Okay, motion passes. Thank you, everybody. Um, the next item is uh, PLS Third Learning, and this is a administrative evaluation tool. Um, and we, um, we were able to make the ask the questions that were brought up at committee last week or last two weeks ago, excuse me, um, about 
the contract date and everything. So this is now a 15 month contract. So I'll be using it for me and working with all of you this semester and then having the opportunity to add on other participants from DLT for next year. Okay. And this, what I think you probably received a message from IASB that they um, are having a webinar on this tool and it is one that they are recommending for our school boards across the state. We have a motion please. So moved. Second. Okay. Any other comments, discussion? Okay, hearing none. Uh, roll call, please. Drum key. Aye. Essel. Aye. Kolkarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Okay, motion passes. And again, all those things had been uh, at least um, the discussion in the uh, um, committee meeting earlier in the month. What we're looking at now are a couple things that uh, um, came in after um, the educational tour. No, that the, the tour request we talked mm -hmm. about. I'm sorry, no. I'm getting ahead of myself. We don't, no, 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 we did not no this is a new one. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to state. came in after, yeah. Yeah. after the uh, PNP meeting. So this is a new. You probably request. didn't know we needed it yet. Yeah, exactly. Right. Okay. They qualified so, and now they'd yeah. like to go. Yeah. So I was, <laughs> I was correct the first time. Uh, educational tour request. This is the uh, uh, Libertyville High School debate uh, team state competition. So another team going to state. Uh, and it's a tour request for March 17th through 19th. So if we can have a motion, please. Move to improve, approve the educational tour request as listed. Second. Okay, any comments or questions? Wish them good luck. Yeah, yeah. Good. congratulations. Good on luck at LHS debate. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Okay, uh, roll call, please. Essel. Aye. Kolkarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Okay, motion passes. Uh, we have uh, one last item here is employment of employees. Mm -hmm. These are um, some um, hires, replacements, uh, that type of thing uh, that came in after our committee meeting two weeks ago. Uh, so they're here as a separate item on the uh, PMP. So can we have a motion, please? Are they here? Yes, here? we do have, we have two of the people who are listed who are here and I would really uh, appreciate the opportunity to introduce them to the board. Great. Wonderful. If I could please have Iman Ellis Bowen go to the podium. I'd like to be able to welcome you officially to District 128. If you guys could join me in welcoming her. Dr. Bowen comes to us currently from Joliet Township School District, and she has worked as a special education teacher, as a leader of school counselors, social workers. She has a vast array of experience in helping students with their social emotional learning, their behavior, everything affective you are a guru at, and we are so looking forward to having you join our team. So I wanted to give you a minute to say a few things about yourself and um, see if the board has any questions. <laughs> Good evening, um, District 128 Board of Education, um, district leadership, um, parents, community, anyone we have left in the room, <laughs> as well as those who are looking on um, online. Uh, greetings. Again, my name is Dr. Iman Ellis Bowen. I am honored yet humbled um, to assume this position of assistant superintendent for student services um, come July the 1st. Um, as a mentor of mine would say, uh, when they are beyond excited, I am dis deliciously delightful <laughs> <laughs> to join the 128 Daring Team. Um, as uh, uh, Dr. Herman has stated, um, I come with a array of experiences, um, but I come to you also um, a learner um, as well as a team member, and I look forward to working alongside of you um, as we take this journey. So thank you so much.
And do okay. we have another one? Thank you so right. much. Thank you. Thank you for being Welcome here. Welcome aboard. We really appreciate it. Welcome. And next, I would like to invite Yesenia Sanchez to go to the podium. And Yesenia um, is going to be our new assistant superintendent for teaching and learning starting July 1. Yesenia comes to us from North Chicago currently and has worked at a few other suburban districts. Um, and we are so excited, excited to have you join our team as well. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity to serve the D128 community. I'm looking forward, oops, <laughs> there we go. I'm looking forward to learning and growing alongside all of you. Um, I am eager to meet everyone, especially our students. I can't wait to learn about their dreams and aspirations and work towards ensuring that every single one of them has the opportunities and supports necessary to embody every aspect of our daring mission. Thank you so much. I have to admit, it's uh, odd for us to see Rita Fisher's name in parentheses. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. Welcome to both of you. It's yes. Excited to have you. I, I, I am incredibly impressed. I'm looking at their um, professional summaries and um, I'm really excited for both of you to join our district. Uh, you'll uh, forgive me for lumping both of you together, but both of you have just sterling qualifications, experience and education. Um, and I'm very excited to welcome you to be a part of the D1 2018. Thanks for coming tonight. Okay. Um, move to approve the employment of employees. Yeah. I'll second. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Roll call, please. Um, can I? I do sure, actually have. Sure, can, sure. Would you mind just giving us a, a brief um, summary of how many people you interviewed for these positions? Oh, good idea. Yes. Um, Bryant can correct me, but I'm going from member because we just did screening for a few other positions today. Um, but for the uh, teaching and learning position, I believe we had about 45 applicants. Um, we phone screened about 12. We brought six candidates in for face-to-face mm. -face interviews and then had three people join us back for the final round. Um, and the assistant, the student services role was similar, not quite as many applicants, about 40 applicants in the same process, 12 phone interviews for screening, six face-to-face -face interviews with two committees. And again, both of the um, panels that we had, we tried to get as much input from students, or excuse me, from staff members as we could. Um, we also integrated some performance tasks into the um, interview process. So it was beyond just a verbal interview, but also showing us some of the, um, their abilities in terms of project management and some other things that we asked them to do. Um, so again, we have incredibly talented uh, educators joining our team. If I might just add, I know interviewing on both sides of that interview line can be intensely, can be very intense and, and tiring for everybody. So thank you for doing it. I'm pleased that we had such a robust candidate pool. Um, I'm always proud to see that the district is an employer of choice and is able to draw many, many qualified candidates. Um, I'm not surprised that there were fewer candidates if my understanding is correct, not every district has a student services position. So there's probably fewer people in equivalent roles that would apply. Whereas most districts, if not all have a, uh, a position for instruction, for a curriculum position. Yes. Is, that, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Great, okay. Well, I know it's a monumental effort and that you were, uh, you got to meet many, many people in the <laughs> district <laughs> throughout the process. So thank you for your patience and sticking with us and uh, welcome to both of you. Okay, now we have a roll call. <laughs> Cole Carney. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. <clears throat> Aye. Hessel. Aye. And that passes. And again, welcome. And that concludes the. Uh... Want to come up? I think the board would appreciate having yeah. you at a community. Raise your hand. Sure.
Is that what I saw? <laughs> and the work goes on. I just, oh, there it is. Dan, I'm sorry. I, uh, I usually send you questions yeah, beforehand, and that one I caught late. Yeah, I'm going to search it too. Oh, it's called the diligent. Okay. I'm going to double check. I mean, um, it is done, but. I mean, I only have about seven more. Okay, so I, without further ado, I think we are going to turn it over to Chairperson Rooney so we can get the Facilities and Finance Committee rolling, if you don't mind. Sure, why not? <laughs> All right, Facilities and Finance, we're going to start with the Fiscal Year 21 Annual Comprehensive Financial Report. As the name implies, this is an annual exercise, um, about 180 pages worth. And Dan? this was the report that we discussed in committee where we had the auditor yep. uh, very kindly visit us to add some color commentary to what mm -hmm. would always be Dan's own um, presentation. Yes, uh, Betsy came by, championed through, waited a long time uh, to talk to us. So it was good. We had a good experience again to summarize. Um, we had a, a positive audit. There's not really a management, management letter. The standard thing they do is put in a technology notice for every client, which really you'll never be able to resolve, to be honest. Um, but yeah, it, it, was a, it was a positive experience all around. So yeah, it's just, I thought it would be nice for you to hear from somebody other than me, because who knows, maybe I could be lying to you this whole time. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was a very good experience. And so yeah, we have our annual Comprehensive financial report for fiscal year 21. And this is an important piece of data, just FYI, that I need to be able to build my long-term financial projections, which are coming in March. So that's 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 one not only be able to reflect back on what happened, but able to use to build for future projections. And this is a report that is required by the state, correct? This is not a report that was, this particular report is not required by the state. So what's required by the state is an audit. And what was required is to fill out the annual financial report to the state. So what we are doing is technically above and beyond what's the minimum required from requirement from the state, but what we are doing is really the best in class financial reporting you can do. Um, so uh, they used to be called the comprehensive annual financial report. That's something that you'll see with um, a lot of a lot of companies, firms beyond just school districts um, that takes a lot more data, a lot more comprehensive data than this. It looks 10 year trend data. That's mostly at the back. There's the management discussion analysis, which is much more thorough than you'd find in a typical uh, school district financial report. So there's, um, there's a number of districts that do this. This is not something that every district does, uh, but this is some uh, tradition this district has had for a long time. And the value I understand is in transparency. Is that correct? Yeah, it, it, it sets up because it's a full accrual. It sets up, it, it, it's, to be honest, it's probably more meaningful for, for owners of debt. So if the district had bonds out there, um, this information is more translatable to the millions of companies out there that have debt and the owners of that various debt to be able to understand in a consistent 
apples to apples way, what's happening with the district's net position, um, fund balance, all those kinds of things that, to be honest, like a, a lot of us for management day-to-day -day purposes, the net position is doesn't it, it's not a it's not a number that we really use to make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis it's more trying to accurately based on a bunch of accounting rules that a group decided would be really good for everybody to follow to report on that so you have a consistent reporting really throughout the country so again in your evaluation going above and beyond to do this audit serves what purpose um i i that's a, that's a great question if I wish I had time to think of a better answer. Could I answer that in my question? Certainly. And that is the, the other reports that you do, the, the, the financial report to the state, whatever, basically looks at what we did during this year, sort of recaps that fiscal year and looks at it that way, where this actually looks at the overall financial health of the district in context of a larger, a larger scope of, you know, looking at it over trend years and things like that versus just looking at how did we do this year this to me gives more of an overall health financial health of the district yeah it, it's the highest level of reporting that you can do there's nothing fancier more explanatory that nothing beyond this so this is the highest level of financial reporting that it can be used. thank you it's another set of eyes Yes, that's important. And we appreciated Betsy taking the time to come yeah. and give her clean. Yeah, and beyond health. even just Betsy, these are submitted to two agencies for review as well. So the um, Governor's Financial Officers Association reviews this as well, um, as well as the uh, Association for School Business Officials International, they also review this based on their set of standards to see does this reporting, and, and, if, and if it does, then we get an award, which that data is included, like last year's award is included in this as well, so. Yes, thank you. It's, uh, like I said, 180 pages of a lot of detail, so, and publicly available. Um, any other questions, comments? Okay, hearing none, can I have a motion to approve the fiscal year 2021 annual comprehensive financial report? So move. Second. Roll call, Carol. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Essel. Aye. Kokarni. Aye. All right, motion passes. Thank you, Dan, for all your work on that. Moving on to the Vernon Hills High School roof replacement bid recommendation. Yeah, so as reviewed at the committee meeting, um, we had three bids for this. Um, this came in a bit higher than we had est estimated. Every, every time you estimate, you have things coming over, things coming under. This is one unfortunate incidence where uh, this came in quite a bit over um, our estimates. Um, just a reminder, I believe our estimate was like 646000 this low bid came in at 868,000. So is that right? Yeah, thank you. Um, so th this is a, oops, I just closed it and give me one second. I have to find that file again. <laughs> Be easier to do this in the future. Um, uh, the low bid Bennett and Verso. Verso roofing, uh, base bid of 868,000. Um, we're only we're only recommending the base bid, right? But not the alternate. So, um, what was the alternate ad just for the record? One hundred twenty thousand, um, but that that's going to be way too out of our price range um, for all of our projects. Which was for additional sections of the roof. Yeah. Yeah, that's something we'll have to look at at a future project. And the increased cost, can we attribute that to the inflation of some of the raw materials, things like that? Uh, part of it is. Inflation of materials. Um, when we looked at, oh, sorry, <laughs> when the project was originally looked at, um, um, bidding it when we are estimating it, we're we're between the thirty-one and thirty-five dollar range, and we came in forty to forty-one dollars. But we also added additional scope to the project with the EFIS doing the base of the building and gave that to the roofing contractor, so that was also a scope increase. Okay. Um, into the cost. So half our fault, half not our fault. But it made sense to do that if you're going to 
do this project, doing them in conjunction would actually be more cost Doing it in conjunction with the, the EFIS contractor, it made sense to have a roofing contractor handle the base of the building for the future roofing projects to tie in um, when we re, you know replace roofs around the base of that structure. And it was this a summer project? Is this when does this? Yes, it'll be summer. Be? This okay. summer project. Uh, and and as a reminder, hold on. Which, this is the roof replacement. This is um, the one. This is the project that where you're using the state maintenance grant. That's fifty thousand dollar matching grant. That's what this is for. As, I mean, it's it's that plus obviously a a, a, a bit fair bit more. The, the other thing I just wanted to revisit real quick based on our committee meeting last week. So when we last showed our project list uh, for the summer back in January, um, at that point, our running total was just under 3.3 million. This gets us closer to 3.6 million. When you look at this in con context with all the other projects going on. However, we have a very large unknown still, and that is our fax labs or family consumer science labs that that yes. that bidding is going to be opening next friday next friday yeah. next friday and so that that one that's a million and a half dollar project that could it could be 1.2 it could be one we don't really know yet um so that that's a big one that can vary quite a bit um but based on where we're at we're we're still comfortable moving forward with the bids that we have here and in the other ones came in a bit under, so those are those are well. One came a little bit older. The, the other ones were much closer to our estimate, but okay. in terms of giving you the overall context. Okay, thank you for putting that in context with the the whole summer project listing. Any questions? Does the fax one end up being wilder than we than our imagination by our approving this? Do we get in trouble? Uh, I don't believe so. Um, it, it depends on what it depends on what comes in, and we'll have to look at that. So, if it comes in at two million, uh, we're going to have to sit down and see like is 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 this worth it? What did we miss in the scope? Is there a way to reduce this scope, perhaps to get it within line, um, or is this just obviously not the right time to do this project? Um, that something else is telling us we, this is not the right time to do this project. We, we unfortunately we can't cross that bridge until we get that data. Um, and then even having conversations. So often you'll get bids in and then you don't necessarily know what drove the cost. And so you, the, sometimes the consultant has to kind of dig in and figure out like what, what are the drivers that, what are the assumptions that we thought going in that were different? Um, we have to, we have to dig into that data and all this, but I'm pretty sure it's all going to come in under and we're going to, we're going to be like, well, these are so cheap projects. Um, but we'll, <laughs> We'll see. I, I, I can't. Yeah. So it's, it's truly unpredictable right now. Um, but nevertheless, this is where we find ourselves. Dan, just uh, for organization, I know you showed us the, the project list, the ex, you know, what our, um, where our goal was, is there a way to include that? Cause I don't see it every time and can't keep them, keep that in my thoughts when we're looking at what we're approving, just almost like a tick list to say, this is what we were expecting and we're ticking, you know, just so that we kind of have a path of yeah. where we're going. And I can't remember every month, you know, what we said, if I, we could attach that to our packet just so we can see where we are. Yes. So, so sorry, it's not in there now. When we had talked about it, I recall that we did it, but I did not include it with your packet. I have it right here, but that doesn't really help you right now. Um, but yes, that's something we'll include going forward on these, especially when these are bid projects relative to our, our summer capital list. I would say that would be helpful for the committee packet yes, because that's where the, a lot of the discussion. Mm -hmm. So the up right up front, when we right. talk about, or, or I would process. say whenever we have different data, right. Whether right. we have a right. new estimate or we have right. an actual price to talk yeah. about. Right. Any other questions? All right, hearing none, can I get a motion to approve the bid for uh, Bennett and Brousseau roofing in the amount of 868,000, that's correct? Yes. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Kolkarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. All right, moving on uh, for the bid analysis for 2022 auditorium and fly tower, um, EFIS wall remediation. Yeah, so the EFIS wall, again, reviewed in committee, we had 
uh, two bids for this. Um, the low bid was with coal construction for $296,900 for the base bid. Uh, the cover memo, um, an astute board member who shall remain nameless, um, but his name starts with a D and rhymes with Don. Um, <laughs> notice the, the, the memo that our consultant gave us uh, did not have the right numbers in there. It, the, so the base bid is two, the, the, the numbers are right, but What's in there is let me let me just say the right sentence. The base bid is two hundred ninety six thousand nine hundred dollars. The base bid includes a monetary allowance of twenty five thousand. The memo says zero thousand, so that's zero thousand is incorrect. It's twenty five thousand is an allowance that's built into that. So there's not it's not on top. It's inclusive of that number. Fifteen thousand for fifteen thousand. I'm sorry for the monetary allowance. Twenty five thousand for the material allowance. So material, and actually that's noted on the bid tab. If you see there's a footnote that says the, the, the monetary. monetary allowance is 15,000. And then the bid is, is based on a thousand square foot. And it's $25 a square foot. So it's 25,000. Um, so that's included there. If that stuff is needed, if it's not needed, then the project will end up costing us less, less. which okay. will help kind of balance the whole thing. And that, that happens a lot in these projects. There's things built in that if they're not realized, then we don't spend it. Um, so we, we build those in, those are in a lot of our projects. Um, so that will, it always ends up kind of working out in our final prices or that we end up paying, like literally the checks that we cut to the companies. Okay. Good catch, Don. Anybody else questions? I just have a note to self to not make assumptions because I thought maybe that's how bids look. If it's zero, they just call it zero. <laughs> I should have asked. Not normally, no. Yeah, so yeah, I, I did not notice that last time, so. Okay, hearing no other questions or comments, can I get a motion to approve the contract for coal construction in the amount of $296,900? So moved. Second. Roll call, please, Carol. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Brumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Kolkarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Motion passes. Uh, moving on to the Vernon Hills High School Masonry Lintel Remediation Bid Recommendation. That's a mouthful. Mm. Uh, yeah, so this is the, the masonry work, particularly on the entrance on the east, east side, east side um, uh, to fix that and, and other things. So that one we had one, two, three, three bids for that. The low bid was for Berglund. Um, in the base amount of $199,500. And then we had an alternate for um, Vernon, or for, excuse me, Libertyville High School Masonry of 29,500. We are including that one as in as an add-on, correct? Correct. Yep, so um, the, to so the total cost would be 229,000 for the base plus alternates awarded to Berglund um, Construction. And that came in under that, I think our estimate for that one is 335. So that one was one that came in under. And this is again part of our ongoing efforts to maintain the buildings and uh, keep them in tip top shape. Any questions? Is this is the one where there's like uh, the wall uh, didn't have appropriate supports and stuff. Do we have any like? Was there a warranty issue like when we got the building? <laughs> did they say like if it doesn't work out as planned, you can? Uh, Twenty years later, it doesn't matter. Um, okay. So, but but I, I will say yes, it was found that it was not it was not a condition that we would have wanted it to be in. But they did put it in to a safe condition. It's not a right. pretty condition. Right. This is to make it make safe it and pretty <laughs> for the right. long term. <laughs> and the savings offset the roof, right? I mean, I remember no. kind of. It, not this one. Not not yet. Sorry. It it helps offset some of some of some of yes. <laughs> I think some of. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Can I get a motion to approve the contract for Berglund Construction Company in the amount of two hundred twenty nine thousand dollars? So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Uh, roll call, please, Carol. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Kulkarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Uh, can I real quick just put an overall 
picture on this. So, so the, the reason we do this, we kind of do it this way is because like the bidding and all that kind of stuff <laughs> is because of the state laws require us to do this. So anytime you issue public funds, depending on how you want to issue it, you have to follow certain rules. And so what you can't do is if you want to do a project that costs over 25,000 or 50,000, depending on what you're doing, you can't just pick a company you want to use and do it because the fear is you're just going to pick your brother and give the money to them. So you have to do publicly bid. So these are sealed bids that they give us. We don't know what they're going to bid. We think what we, we guess what we think we're going to see based on what other, other, other projects that happen in our consultants. Um, but once you never know what, what a bid comes in and the purpose of the bid is really to try to get the best deal for the district. So that's why we do this. We show you the bids and we go through this whole process. So it is very clear and transparent that, that everything is following the proper legal authority to issue these contracts. So thank you. Thank you. And I know we've asked before, we've talked about this before, but sometimes there's a, a great discrepancy in those bids when they come in. And I know you guys work with them to make sure they understood the scope of the work. Um, some of them are way out of whack uh, when you look at some of these numbers. So just to assure anyone from the public that may be curious when we get all these bids, we're not, we're making sure that those contractors understand the scope of the work and what we're asking them to do. Yes, when, you know, once we receive the bids, the lowest bid, you know, our consultants will have a conversation with them, go over their bids and make sure that they, um, their bids are correct. Did they miss anything, especially when there is a big difference in the bids? Um, and then you'll see, we always get a letter attached that they understand the scope and they're honoring their bid, you know, for that project. Um, that gives them, if, if they miss something, uh, they can withdraw their bid at that time. You know, and then we would move to the next lowest bidder. Perfect. Just so anyone listening can have an understanding of that process. All right, motion passes. Uh, moving on to LHS yearbook agreement. I know Herf Jones has been around for a while. Uh, I think we have a yearbook in our house from 2011 <laughs> that's still floating around. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so that this so norm, normally depends on the contract. Sometimes contracts like this don't necessarily come to the board, uh, but we're playing the safe side because you all re may remember from Betsy's thing that there was a Gatsby update um, that went, in, went into impact last year that, that actually student activity monies are now all part of district funds rather than there was kind of separate, like we still kind of are over them, but they're kind of separate. They're no longer kind of separate. They're now wrapped in. And so um, technically this is going to be expenditure of funds, e even though the main, the main revenue source for this is going to be students paying their yearbook fee for those that want it um, to pay that end offset the cost. Um, so that's why, that's why this is here. They've had a, they've had a really good experience with them. Um, five years is the standard that we, we, we do for contracts that work out pretty well. Um, and, uh, yeah. Yep. Any questions or concerns? All right. Um, can I get a motion to approve the contract with Herf Jones in the amount of $82,652 for LHS yearbook? Per year. Per year. So moved. Second. Roll call. Drum key. Aye. Kessel. Aye. Cole Carney. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Right, motion passes. <coughs> Moving on to the district office lease agreement. This is uh, new information from the committee from the committee meeting. Well, we we, we talked about it at the committee. Um, so so this is oh, wrong one. Um, sorry, I had the wrong one up. Sorry, I clicked on Spotify. Hold on. <laughs> It's right now, next to the. Now we know what you listen to. Mm -hmm. um, you can use yeah, a little music. Mm -hmm. Podcast. <laughs> no. Um, okay. So so we we are come we are, the so we've talked about this a little bit. I'll just give you a brief overview. Mm -hmm. uh, but also this is it's a significant contract. So there's a lot of money tied to this contract. Uh, the district office has been leasing uh, that space for, the last ten years or so, and so that is coming up due in December of 2022, so the end of this year. So call it six to 10 months ago, somewhere in that range, we wanted to kind of start working on this because um, there's a lot of 
there's a lot of things to negotiate in contracts like these. You don't do a 10-year lease every year, right? You do it every 10 years. Uh, so there's a lot of data points to consider and a lot of a lot of a lot of levers to move in this process. And so we engage with the tenant with a tenant agent, um, Richard Morris from Avis Young, uh, who has done a great job. He worked with us with this lease, but and also the transition program lease. That's the next one on the agenda. Um, so what this technically is in front of you is an amendment to our current lease. So, um, so we have an existing lease that is still going to kind of be in play, but this is an amendment that replaces a lot of the language in there. Um, there are a number of great things that Rick, uh, Rick Morris was able to put in there. Um, our price is going up to $9 and 15 a square foot on the net on the, the just the base rent costs. Um, but honestly, in Rick, in Rick's, in Rick's, um, and normally I wouldn't talk about this because of the, we're negotiating all this kind of stuff, but it's here and we're ready to approve. Uh, normally prices can be higher depending on what you're doing. So you'll see the Libertyville lease, lease that, or the Liberty Mill Plaza lease, which is the transition program is higher than that because of the nature of that, that property. Um, Rick's state was anything under $10 um, square foot he thinks is worth it. And so he helped build us, um, build us this contract. There's several months of free rent associated with that. Also there in our, in our front suite, they're gonna replace the carpet, the lighting, the ceiling. Um, they're going to help us expand our kitchen, um, make it twice the size. Um, so th that's re really exciting. They're gonna help us look at landscaping because if you look out Denise's window, it's pretty bad to be honest. Um, well, now it's everything's dead, but it, even in the spring, it doesn't look very nice. Um, so they're gonna do that and explore, Kelly, I don't know if you're here, but they're gonna explore car charging. Um, stations for that because it's not our property. So we can't just put stuff in like that. Um, then um, there is price, price. So to the previous question, there's price escalation uh, limits. So this is, this is negotiated price to go up 2.5% a year uh, for the 10 years. Um, that's the base rent. And then the operating, um, the operating is limited to go up 1% a year. Um, or that that's kind of an estimate. I think technically the language um, is that it's limited to a 7%, 7% um, cap, um, which is a cap, cap we've never had before, even on our current lease, there is no cap. And so that's something that we can audit basically to check, hey, are, is this really within line? And so if it is, then they have to give us the money back. Um, so this is this before you is a 10 year lease extension on our current lease for the district office um, all in um, so 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 really our, our annual lease payment right now all in included is is usually around 190,000 it's going to go up to about 200,000 so just to give you a scale of kind of what it what we're anticipating it's changing to the first year we'd only pay 89,000 because we're getting a ton of months of free rent um, which it's is like part nine. of what, Huh? Nine months. Nine yeah, months which is what um, Rick is part of the negotiations um, uh, in in that process, uh, which was which is great. So all in all, you know, we don't really know what operating expenses are going to be a few years from now because that's dependent on what actual costs they incur. But say they follow a normal trajectory, you're talking two point two to two point three million dollars over the life of this contract is what we're estimating the cost of this to be. Uh, and so yeah, we've we've had great experience with this. Lynn Himes himself. Uh, reviewed this amendment. So this has been thoroughly vetted by both Rick and Lynn. Rick is the tenant agent. So like a real estate agent you can think of, uh, and then our attorney as well. And this is uh, for the space that we occupy is 16,000 square feet. And yes. that footprint is going to remain the same. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And as you mentioned, they're doing quite a few improvements and renovations at their cost at their so cost you're doing that off the lease though right because under the lease all the alterations are our responsibility so you have a separate agreement prior to do all that Excuse me. You know, part of the lease is no. that we can make alterations right but if we if we have to do fifty thousand or under we don't have to really get their blessing uh, but anything over than that we're going to have to talk with them and make sure that they're okay with that and we certainly have changes to come because we have more offices to find mm -hmm. um which is a great problem you know good problem to have uh so yeah we're going to have more changes to that but but yeah these are part of what we negotiated in in with them and those those the changes that i talked about that are articulated in the lease extension yep. are at their cost yeah it's, it's very negotiating yeah and it's, it's very reasonably priced. Speaking as someone who 
works and worked in Innovation Park, this is, uh, this is a very reasonable price. So um, how should we do the motion just as the amendment as presented? Uh, Not a dollar actual do total dollar. Yeah, yeah, you'd approve the okay. amendment, the amendment to the lease as presented. And uh, I would also note, so technically, um, Lynn's recommendation is to remind us that we actually need a two thirds approval for this to actually be legally adopted. So if we don't get two thirds of board vote, so this is not a majority approval that you need two thirds. So just to be clear on what, what is legally required for this to be a legal approval. Because it's real estate? Yep. Okay, good to know. Yep. Any other questions? Hearing none, can I get a motion to approve the tenure amendment to our district office lease? So moved. Second. Second. All right, roll call please. Essel. Aye. Kolkarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. All right. That's our two thirds. So motion passes. Uh, moving on to Liberty Mill Plaza lease agreement. Yeah. So the translation this is our transition program that we have talked about for a while. Um, this, the rubber is meeting the road. So last week at the Libertyville village, village board meeting, uh, they, they gave their blessing on us to move forward and just had great timing that we also had final, the final contract uh, for you to approve. So this is also a 10 year um, agreement uh, for the Liberty Mill Plaza. Um, this price is starting at 1450 a square foot. So it is quite a bit higher, but it's due to the nature, it's a retail space. Um, and that is more expensive than like office space, but location, location, location is the name of the game for this program. Um, so part of that is um, it starts out more cost per square foot, but we have a lower escalation. So it's a 2% increase a year on the base cost. So that again, is part of what Nick or uh, Rick, excuse me, was working on. Um, it is a smaller square foot, so it's 6,000 square feet, so it's much smaller than the district office, so there's a little bit less wiggle room there, I guess you could say. Um, there's also um, there's also rental abatement there, I think a couple months in there um, to get us going. Um, but overall, so overall the cost on this would probably end up being around 120,000 a year, um, except for our first year is gonna be a bit less because of the free rent. Um, uh, it's a little more than what I had estimated last time because when we had originally priced out the transition program, we had priced a slightly smaller space than this, um, but we feel this meets our needs and still feel like it'll work out with all the numbers. So, so, so 10 year agreement, the overall life of this contract, again, caps on operating expenses. Don't exactly know what operating expenses are, but if they follow a typical path, we're estimating this would be between 1.2 and 1.3 million dollars over the life of the lease. So just to give you context of, of what this lease agreement is. And this also would require two thirds vote. Um, and once you do this, there's really no turning back for your transition program. So when we, we feel full steam ahead. I think the board has already uh, demonstrated its support for that transition program. So this shouldn't be uh taken as uh, an opportunity to re uh, re-examine that. Mm -hmm. Can I, can I ask, and I know we've talked about this, refresh my memory where this is located. Yeah. So this is on uh, Milwaukee, Milwaukee Avenue. So if you're going kind of not too far from Condell, there's a, there's like a little strip there, a little bit, little bit south of where Geno's East you will used to be, the I guess. Dry cleaners. Okay. The auto, by the tire place. Yeah. It's called three different things. And I'm not being critical. It says Liberty Mill here, M I L L. It says uh, Plaza. It says Liberty Mill Shopping Center, M I L. And then it says Liberty Mill South Mill Shopping Plaza. It's like, I just, I wasn't finding it. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't know which one to use. Yep. Understandable. That sometimes is the difference between the owner, the manager. So if you're even if mm -hmm. next time you drive by the district office, look at how many names are on the sign. Like good luck figuring out who owns it versus who manages it versus mm -hmm. versus the common name yeah. for it. So that's I that's I think what you're seeing. Yeah. In that. yeah. Is okay. it in the space that was the auto? <laughs> 
I mean, mm, I don't know what it was before. Uh, yeah. It's in the space. It was uh, corporate wellness. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, but it's it's, it's right next to O'Reilly Auto yeah. Parts, just yeah. south of O'Reilly, next to the dry cleaners. Yeah. Very good parking. Yeah. Okay. There's always a parking space. It's true. I know because I get my shirts done there. <laughs> they do, don't they? <laughs> Any other important questions? <laughs> well, now we know where Don has a shirt. Done. That's right. Okay. We've got that covered. Any, any questions about the lease? Oh, oh, oh. Is that what you meant? Then uh, also, uh, Rick reviewed this, and Lynn also spent significant time with this because this is not just an amendment; this is a first time lease. So Lynn Himes also spent a fair good, a fair amount of time uh, with Reviewing this lease this. document as well. Okay. All right. I well, move to approve the lease at the Liberty Mill Plaza as presented. Second. Great. Hey. Roll call, please. Cole Carney. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. All right. Full steam ahead for our transition program. Mm -hmm. Motion passes. And that concludes facilities and finance. Yeah. Thank you. Next on the agenda, we have a uh, Lake County Tech Campus Intergovernmental Joint Agreement to approve. Yes, this came in last week, so we didn't have it to share at the committee meeting. It is. Um, the change in Illinois ISPE guidelines requires us to have a much more updated uh, agreement. This has not been updated for over 15 years. <laughs> so um, it definitely is timely. Um, and each board as a member board is updating their uh, agreement with the tech campus. Um, no substantive changes have been made. This is simply an update to our current practices and guidelines. It's an exciting read. <laughs> <laughs> and congratulations on your appointment to the board. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> hey, can I have a motion to approve the Lake County Tech Campus Intergovernmental Joint Agreement, please? So moved. Second. Any discussion? <clears throat> Okay, roll call, please. Rooney. Aye. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Cole Carney. Aye. Okay, motion passes. Uh, do we have any update for the Illinois Association of School Boards? Not at this time. Okay, thank you. Do we have any update for the Special Education District of Lake County? Um, we don't. However, we are meeting on Wednesday, so I'll have more next month. Okay. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Thank you for being our delegate. Uh, future agenda items. We have the um, which budget, Dan, in March? The projections. Uh, yeah, at our at our. Sorry, I lost my train of thought. At our March committee meeting, we'll have mm -hmm. um, updated long-term financial projections. Yes, at our March committee meeting. We'll also have staffing information. Staffing information mm -hmm. for March. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, just to foreshadow, at our April committee meeting, we will be bringing a report from um, our district equity team um, on the first round of data that we've been able to gather for our equity, uh, racial equity and inclusion policy. Did you say for committee in April or for the board meeting? Committee will be the longer presentation and we'll have a brief summary at the regular meeting as well. Great, sounds great. Okay, any other future agenda items? How about the any update or actions or results of the strategic planning meeting that we have this Thursday? Yes, well, we will bring that the updates from that, yes. I think we'll probably wait until we have both the March and the April instead of reporting out after each session. It might be a better use to consolidate the um, the summary of okay. what was found out. Oh, are, am I on the right track with that? Um, or do you think it would be more appropriate to report it at each after each session? I think it might be more appropriate to report it after each just because we're it's a progression. And so I think it might be helpful for the members of the public to understand what we were able to accomplish this week with the stakeholder group, what we were able to accomplish with the staff during the Teacher Institute Day, and then foreshadow what we'll be doing together in April. If there was any 
thing you might change as a result of might have thought the next session will we'll do x but based on the feedback you get mm -hmm. this week you might change course mm -hmm. so for uh you think for the next committee meeting yes we'll be able to have an update of what we've accomplished to date okay so i'll just jog my memory um a, a couple of committee meetings back we had talked about capital projects moving forward and how we wanted to kind of check various buckets um multiple categories or, or projects that might kind of check off multiple categories of goals that we had kind of prioritizing which capital projects uh are other initiatives or improvements that we wish to make in the district um i can't remember if we were going to collaborate to make a list somehow if that was going to be presented to the board later on if Dan, any, any information on that? I'm just curious where we stand. Yes, so last time we talked, we're developing a process for um, basically coming up with and prioritizing those projects. Mm -hmm. And so we are still working on that. So once we have that developed, we'll bring that back to you and kind of show you, this is the process that we're, we're looking at doing and then take feedback based on that. That's not something we have ready yet. So we're still working on that. I couldn't tell you it's coming in March or April right now, but I, but we're, we're working on it. Thank you. I just, mm -hmm. yeah, wanted to kind of know what the status was. Thank you. Yep. Okay. I'm gonna keep asking any other future agenda items because we keep getting great suggestions. Okay, then um, I before we uh, convene an executive session for the purpose of discussing collective negotiating matters, 5 ILCS 120 2C2 and board self evaluation, 5 ILCS 120 2C16, we are going to take a brief two to three minute recess for a bio break and then we will convene an executive session. Can I have a motion? Move to move to executive session. Thank you. Second. Second, great. Motion passes. See you in two to three minutes, please. Do we have to roll call? Oh, roll call. We'll do a roll call. Sorry. Roll call. Batson. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Kolkarni. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Great. Now the motion passes. Thank you.